Adrian and Mark Rothko are commonly used as the inspiration for architectural party designs. These paintings offer lessons on compositional scale, alignment, and layering that also apply to architecture. This thesis aims to broaden this reciprocal relationship between art and architecture by exploring the ways in which the abstract modernist painting techniques of the late work of Mark Rothko can affect the compositional form and viewer experience of a mixed use artist residency in Georgetown, DC. And the goal of this thesis is to explore how architecture can be designed as not only a place for art, but as art itself, or in this project specifically to explore how a building can simulate the experience of viewing a Rothko painting. My research provides some key context to this exploration. This first chapter looks at how the color, textures, and composition of certain paintings could influence architectural design. The art form of painting specifically brings a unique relationship to architecture because of its similar approaches to composition, but different approaches to two-dimensional form like color and texture. The painting on the right by Theo van Doesburg is a key example of artwork from the De Stiel movement that would later inspire a new architectural movement. This next chapter explores the different ways in which two modern artists, Rothko and Mondrian, start to push the barrier between art and architecture. Many of Rothko's later paintings, like Red, focus on thin washes of color and texture, but leave the composition as a simple set of rectangles. Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie is also an abstracted interpretation of the New York City street grid. This exploration can be further narrowed to the late works of Rothko because of his emphasis on the environment and architectural experience of his paintings. The geometric composition of Rothko's late paintings were influenced by his early studies of the urban streetscape and geological strata, Rothko was also very particular about how his work was displayed, regulating architectural factors such as scale, lighting, location, and permanence. He preferred to show his paintings in low natural light, in tall rooms, and away from other artists. They were also meant to be permanent installations. He became known for painting murals and designing compositions specifically to be hung in a certain space, like the Rothko Chapel, which I'll touch on more shortly. So this is one of Rothko's most famous paintings called White Center. Like most of his late works, he focuses on utilizing thin washes of color painted over a solid background and blurred rounded edges to create an effect of luminosity and emotion. My own first experience seeing a Rothko painting was at the National Gallery of Arts, and I remember feeling this immense sense of awe when I walked into the room. The paintings evoked a kind of juxtaposing experience of both serenity and strong emotion, and that is the experience this building aspires to evoke as well. So taking a closer look at Rothko's late works and how they can influence my project. I selected 10 of Rothko's paintings to be the focal point of my project based on their small differences, including variations in color, texture, negative space, and more, and organized them here chronologically. After doing a detailed analysis of each of these 10 paintings, I identified these 11 commonalities in both his technique and the effect on the visitor experience. So the common elements of a Rothko painting include blurred edges, luminosity, layering, complementary colors, negative space, ser serenity, simplicity, dramatic scale, lighting, surprise, and emotion. This thesis aims to take these ideas and apply them architecturally through an emphasis on the visitor experience. So making the visitor experience of the building the same as the viewer experience of a Rothko painting. So shifting gears to the site, I chose Georgetown as my site because I feel that the neighborhood is lacking an accessible arts institution, but also has a strong educational, commercial, and residential presence. I settled on this industrial site along the CNO Canal on Water Street, which is under the Whitehurst Freeway and across from the Georgetown waterfront. It's a very large site with lots of visibility and accessibility. Overall, it provides an interesting opportunity to create a new pedestrian promenade from M Street down to the waterfront. And here is an aerial view of the site. Here you can see where the site is in relation to nearby areas like M Street, Caddy's Alley, the CNO Canal, the Georgetown waterfront, and the freeway. Uh, this specific area and the promenade down the steep hill will be the focus area of this design. Here are the site sections looking at the dramatic slope from the waterfront to M Street with the key bridge in the background. And this showing the Whitehurst Freeway kind of hides the existing building. Um, and the relationship of the freeway to Water Street at the ground level. 
and then a plan of the site relationship to the Whitehurst Freeway itself. Another thing of interest is the Francis Scott Key Memorial Park to the north of the site, which is a large area of trees and has potential for views to nature. Here you can see that the site's in a relatively low density area with mostly commercial zoning around it. Again, the site has lots of access to nature with the canal, the park on the north, and the waterfront to the south. Here you can see the numerous ways of approaching the site from the busy M Street and Key Bridge, but it's mostly through pedestrian traffic. These are the most important axes that connect M Street to the waterfront and their key intersecting points. Um, these are the two key entry points to the site based on the surrounding traffic. And these, site, these views from passing cars on the bridge and freeway will also be important. And this diagram shows how different levels of the building could potentially align and shift with key site elements. So moving on to the building program, a primary goal of this project is to provide support for fine artists to pursue their dreams of being a professional artist without any of the uh, financial pressures. The public facing part of the building aims to draw in as many people as possible, whether it's shoppers on M Street, students from nearby schools, or just people looking to support local artists. Addressing this profile and the opportunities of the site, the primary program of my building will include a public storefront and art galleries, a cafe, a private artist studio, small classrooms, and numerous private apartments for a residency program of fine artists, as well as a series of public gathering spaces, both indoors and outdoors. And right now the building's totaling around 37,000 square feet. Um, a few precedents were also key influences on this project. As I mentioned, the Rothko Chapel is an interesting example of a space that was designed by Rothko himself solely to house these specific artworks, implying that the building itself is also part of the painting's experience. And it's a common example of the meditative experience his paintings often evoke. Finally, the Nelson Atkins Museum is a good example of how material and negative space can be used to emulate the luminosity and composition of a Rothko painting. So taking all these ideas and briefly looking at the design process, uh, this is the big idea behind the project's part T, using a blocking sequence in section to create a path from M Street to the waterfront through a descending promenade. A strong vertical core is another key aspect of this part T, so these are some earlier explorations of possible core locations in plan, section, and axon. These are some of the moments that were important to include in the design based on both the site and Rothko analysis, including a sculpture garden, artist apartments, a glass bridge, outdoor cafe, and again, the descending public promenade sequence. So now I'm going to go over the final design and then I'll go back and explain the Rothko analysis that guided the experience of some of these key moments in the public promenade. The building is named Waterfall because the flow of water in a waterfall, I think, is a good metaphor for the circulation through this project, blending the dynamism of the site with the serene experience of a Rothko painting. So kind of having the site represent speed while Rothko represents stillness and serenity. This design includes a clear promenade from M Street to the Potomac waterfront with curated moments of speed and stillness. The design also takes advantage of the steep slope and features this dramatic glass bridge. And then there's a series of smaller glass br bridges connecting the three cantilevered volumes. This axon diagram shows how the stepping movement of the public sequence core uh, inspired the waterfall metaphor, imagining how water would naturally flow through the bridge and down to the main lobby. So showing that movement in section as well with program getting bigger throughout the descent and a four-story atrium acting as the core of the building. Here's the roof plan of this building in context. And on level one, you enter from Water Street into the lobby, then move straight back to this large glass elevator and grand staircase that acts as the vertical circulation core throughout the entire building. Uh, this level also has some commercial programming like a bike shop at the west corner to address the bike path that's coming from that direction and an artist supply store at the east corner with a secret speakeasy hidden in the back to further draw in the community. There's also a large interactive maker space for visitors to make their own art that might have cur uh, been curated daily crafts by the artists in residence. And then there's also this grand exterior staircase that acts as a community gathering space. There's mostly commercial and institutional programming on the second floor, like public art galleries, a storefront, cafe, 
outdoor courtyard area and an artist studio that's visible from outside the building as well. Level three is more art gallery space, a conference room, lecture hall, and this accessible green roof space. Then the fourth level is the top of the public sequence with this long, entirely glass bridge that connects the building to M Street. There is a series of smaller glass bridges that connect this public core to the more private programming on either side. And the entry sequence from M Street is somewhat tucked away inside this kind of organic forest area that then opens onto the bridge entrance. Level five is the first entirely private level, which is the first level of apartments for the three artists and residents. They're organized around the central atrium as well. And each apartment uh, is two levels with access to their own private balconies. Finally, the roof is a private accessible green roof for the residents, as well as solar panel arrays on the flat roof surfaces. The material palette blends together the simplicity and modernity of Rothko with the history of the site. So the building entrances and more commercial programming are cladded with a terracotta brick and bronze mullions to mirror the language of the traditional Georgetown style. And the building is uh, overall a milky glass material for most of the volumes, very similar to the Nelson Atkins Museum, uh, which is meant to have a very high luminosity. The atrium and bridge are made of a PV low E glass, and the bridge has a special semi-opaque ceramic frit pattern to minimize solar heat gain. You can see the general application of these materials and some mullion patterns in these elevations, as well as the key visibility of the vertical circulation core with the public elevator and staircase painted in bright red and orange colors. So the key moments in the public promenade sequence are the best way to describe the impact of the Rothko analysis on the final building design because it's largely experiential. Again, here are some call-outs and section of the key moments in the public sequence promenade. This diagram shows the key public sequence moments through the site and plan and extends past Water Street all the way to the waterfront. The sequence starts with the M Street Forest, then the glass bridge, the interior atrium, and the grand exterior staircase, and then continues that gesture through various manipulations of the ground and ceiling planes that culminate in a glass bottom dock, which acts as a continuation of the glass bridge. Um, an LED screen or a moving art installation will be projected underneath the Whitehurst Freeway. And then a large sculptural element that's also functional, kind of like the skateboarding ramp, uh, will be placed at the waterfront edge. And finally, the public sequence will end in a glass bottom dock extending past the waterfront line, which is again, a moment of juxtaposed surprise and serenity. The Water Street entrance is flush with the street line, except for one large setback and glass vestibule to distinguish the lobby entrance. The large LED screen will advertise any of the building's art exhibitions or community events. There's also a linear art gallery that puts art on immediate display to passersby. And the freeway structural elements are highlighted by a red paint and blue LED light strips, as well as the moving art display projected on the underpass. These elements tie back to Rothko because of the large solid planes use of color and the setback of the entrance is meant to imply a blurred edge and negative space. The entrance to the glass bridge is a meditative serene walk through a dense forest that arrives at the entrance to the glass bridge, which then opens up into a dramatic, almost adrenaline inducing experience of walking through the glass bridge. This ties back to Rothko through a dramatic juxtaposition juxtaposition of scale, which creates a sense of anticipation, as well as the blurred edges and transparency of the glass material. Here's some inspiration of that intended experience. So being inside the glass bridge is meant to be a moment of surprise in juxtaposition to the serene forested entrance, and also this idea of compression and expansion. This ties back to Rothko's elements of transparency, luminosity, blurred edges, and surprise. This is the view looking towards the core atrium at the canal level with the glass elevator and connecting stairs being the focal point with great views out to nature. Um, the stepping movement of the atrium reflects Rothko's elements of layering and blurred edges and the scale of the atrium creates a moment of surprise. So here are some inspiration images of that effect. Um, the canal entrance is meant to be a moment of blurred edges by blending nature into the building and creates a 
peaceful outdoor oasis through an outdoor cafe and patio area. Uh, the distinct building volumes juxtapose these moments of negative space between the buildings. Here are some more inspiration images of the intended cafe patio experience. And here's some examples of how the art gallery spaces will look. They'll all have 15 feet tall ceilings with indirect natural lighting, which seeps through the milky glass cladding to create a meditative experience and honor the way that Rothko likes his work displayed. This view from the key bridge towards the sculpture garden at night is meant to maximize public views to the art. There are various moments of colored lights, such as the orange elevator core and pink and blue LED lights which frame the bridge and cantilevered volumes. This highlights the luminous materiality of the building at night and reflects how Rothko's artwork can change dramatically with different levels of daylight. This view again shows the luminosity and acts as a glowing beacon from across the Potomac River. It's also an instance of dramatic scale against the flat Georgetown skyline, like how Rothko liked to display his work. And finally, here are some more examples of exactly how this semi-opaque milky glass material will look with mullions and without much fenestration. This material choice shows simplicity, restraint, transparency, luminosity, and allows for lots of indirect daylighting. So in conclusion, the goal of this thesis is to explore how the composition, technique, and experience of a Mark Rothko painting can transform the built environment from just a place for art to art itself. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions or feedback. Are you ready? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I'm used to Irene starting these. Um, because they're much more thoughtful. So I, I will dive in from, from the backside. I don't, I haven't done this all day, but um, I'm in love with this project. And I, I just wanted to start at sort of my ultimate feeling and work backwards instead of starting at the, the building blocks that you've used to get there. Um, because eventually I think we all need to be judged by what's the outcome and, and, Narrative is extremely interesting, but if narrative fails to get you to a place that you want to be, then it hasn't really done its job. So I'm going to start start at the place that you want to be. I want to be here. <laughs> um, it's it's extraordinary to me for a number of reasons. One is just the idea of tackling Rothko, who is one of my favorite artists, but I've never been able to explain why. And so the analysis of the art was very interesting. It's a very high bar, I believe, to try to equate architecture to art, especially an abstract artist. But um, I find it fascinating whether that's the only way, that's the only set of conclusions to be drawn, I don't know. But they're believable to me, partly because the outcome is believable to me. And so, You know, we've had projects before you and some very nice work, but I, I want to compliment you on something that is kind of across the board, which is the plans make sense. It's a very complicated section, site section, and you've used it to dramatic advantage. It, it, ha it hasn't been a problem. It's been a, a sort of enabler of a very interesting solution. What do you enter from the ground floor towards the river? What do you enter from the second floor towards the canal? What do you enter from higher up? And what's the nature of those spaces? What's the nature of that experience? They're all very different. They all feel set up very well. And I think uh, very well from those individual vantage points. And then eventually you've created a building that I suppose you have massaged for a while because compositionally, it's very complex, but to me, very, very pleasing. So just looking at the elevations, which I can only imagine were reworked 10 to 20 times because they've landed in a place that compositionally, you don't have to know the rules, but there's a lot of, you mentioned a couple of times, the sort of serenity and the intense experience. And I find that in each of the things, the plans, 
the sections, but I, I especially find it in the elevations that there's a kind of calmness about fenestrating big blocks of buildings in simple ways. But then the juxtaposition of these different buildings at different heights at slightly different scales comes together in an interesting composition itself, a composition that I can sort of see relates back to the nature of the way that Rothko composes. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm rambling, but I wanted to start at, at the conclusion where, where I was left after the presentations. Quite beautiful. Thank you. It was a really nice presentation. Um, I only have two questions and then I'll have comments later, but uh, first question, does the walkway, is it public? So it's a public walkway that connects from yeah. the upper to the lower. Um, from M Street to yeah. building? Yes, it's public. And um, there's an elevator in there, right? Yes, okay. and the bridge connects uh, pretty much immediately to the main vertical circulation core with the elevator and the stairs. Great. So I'd say thank you on behalf of many people who go between those two places. Um, but then my second question is about if you could share, I, um, I think I was paying attention, but I might, I was, if you could iterate or explain to us how you kind of came to this form, what, how you used form to get here. So what was your tool? How did you, why did you make these forms like you did? And specifically, I'm interested in those, the gaps, these kind of gap spaces, those interstitials between what kind of appears to be the blocks. Some of them are occupiable on the top or in between. So I'm curious mm -hmm. just a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah. So um, the interstitial spaces between the blocks are meant to represent kind of the negative space between the blocks in a Rothko painting. If you can see, there's a lot of kind of blurring between the different rectangles on a Rothko painting. And so those glass bridges were meant to be a metaphor for that blurring between two spaces. Um, and then the general form of the building, I won't say it's inspired by the composition of a Rothko painting because that could draw too much <laughs> um, criticism, but it, uh, it was originally kind of inspired by these three core blocks that are then um, enhanced by, again, this like dramatic juxtaposition of scale and, um, and composition there. No, I'm, I'm still uh, absorbing sort of your, your intent, your fantastic presentation, and the, especially the analysis of Roth, Rothko. I've always been a, I've always been attracted to Rothko's paintings, and again, I'll, I'll I'll say that I've never understood why, but I'm I'm immediately drawn to them, and I've also see things in nature, so that if I'm if I'm um, you know I'm traveling and I I see something in the sky and I see the layering. And I can't try to capture it in in terms of um, you know photographing it as a meditative device to look back on. Um, you know, it creates a certain abstract memory of about a feeling, and I think that that you've enlightened me on sort of your analysis of Rothko and how it how it begins to inform and and your thesis how it informs the making of architecture. So, did you you develop the program? based on both site analysis and just the intent of, of an artistic mixed use program that could be both a public statement, access to the public. I'm just repeating what I think I, what I heard, but can you just elaborate how you came to deciding and developing the program a little bit more for me? Yeah, so um, obviously highlighting the experience of the artists who live in this building was my initial priority. Um, and creating a place for them where they would be encouraged to pursue art in a free environment and also live in very um, kind of like a serene experience. Uh, the apartments are intentionally very elevated above the key bridge and kind of pulled away from the key bridge to create more of a serene experience. So um, the intent was to give the artists kind of the ideal life for an artist living in Georgetown. Um, and sorry, what was the other part of your question? The program? Well, just how, you know, and, and you're getting that about mm -hmm. how you develop the program and the idea. So I'll just say if, if the idea is you're bringing these artists and residents 
what you're thinking about that either is there what's the right artist that you think that this you're building and what you've created can inspire is there any characteristics about you know either their stylistic work uh the materiality are they painters can they also be sculptors um collagist um mm -hmm. you know etc so yeah the intent was for the artists in residence to be abstract painters themselves kind of just to commemorate uh the inspiration behind the building but obviously it doesn't have to be rothko specific but painters were the intended audience thank you hmm? i'll come back to comments. okay so you have um a huge challenge and that is you know m street elevation versus the what's the street the, the canal level the the Whiter, not the freeway. Water What's Street. In it? Water Street mm -hmm. at the bottom. Um, and I look at the diagram that you have there, public promenade sequence. And, you know, you, and your name, Waterfall. So I'm thinking to myself, this is great because, you know, having been on M Street for, you know, off and on for many years, this idea, I, I sort of saw it as, okay, there's this great move and great positive where from m street i'm going to travel across this amazing bridge and then tumble down you know in some kind of fun way down to canal the canal level and you've gone as far as to take this this experience across the street a little bit with your 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 sidewalks and then think about paving and ending in a in an experience of glass just above the water so there is this sort of um transition this, this sort of travel and journey that i'm seeing very much here and i guess the only thing is for me is that i it it, it was a, a it's an interesting move in your central core like i wanted the bridge to sort of take me down as well and it, it's sort of the, the bridge takes me across and then i have to go to the left or you know into the red zone uh or to, to then sort of get through the rest of the building and um I would not have made that move. So maybe I don't know if you could talk to me as why you made that conscious decision or how do you see that bridge experience terminating? Because it's a big move in your whole scheme. Like it, this bridge does a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it doesn't, but somehow you have to go off of the bridge and disengage with that bridge geometry to experience the rest of the building. Mm -hmm. So I played a lot with the central core location for that very reason. Um, I wanted to have the central core be visible from Canal Street, so okay. that kind of dictated a lot of where the location. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might help if Actually, it's possible. I didn't want to get up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's on the floor, but super close. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, it's here, but then, like, you know, there's. Oops, that's sorry. I thought I understood, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, right. So, right. So, how you can walk us through, but I'm walking this way, mm -hmm. and then um, what happens here, and then. Uh, how do you get, how do you invite me then to go to this sort of stair that I'm no longer seeing where I am to then get down into the, the yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you enter through the bridge and then immediately once you enter the building, you have the choice of taking this elevator and staircase mm -hmm. all the way down the building. Um, I wanted to provide immediate access to the galleries upon entry to the building, since that is the key purpose. Um, and then the bridge kind of also continues here through this glass bubble that permeates the uh, facade. You might be able to see it best see that? in that nighttime rendering. Uh, I can show you. Um, you can see it's like highlighted with this pink so the... LED light strips there and also here. So the glass kind of pushes through the building envelope. Um, you can see it again here um, and oh, in the plan. I just thought the bridge was that vertical piece. Yeah, so it's meant to kind of pop out here. Um, and it aligns kind of directly with the horizon line. So it's meant to be 
a nice view that feels like it kind of continues on forever. And then with the public promenade sequence and the uh, glass bottom dock, it's meant to be this one grand dramatic gesture throughout the entire site. So the other vertical, the other thing that I, I mistake as a waterfall, that's just the, the elevators for the residences? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, that elevator is about half the size of the main public one. Um, but it's still, I think, a great opportunity for putting the core on display. And then if, can you go down to the Canal Street yeah. uh, elevation? That's the floor plan, sorry. This one? I see. It might be one. Water, water Street water, or? Water, water I'm oh, sorry. Okay, sure. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you lose the whole bridge at that point because the bridge is those dashed lines. Yes, yeah. um, but it is kind of meant to have this continued gesture that goes through the lobby space and then kind of connects to the rest of the sequence. I guess I would just say my comment would be that I kind of wished, I mean, you know, this is your building, so, but I kind of <laughs> wish that somehow that bridge took me, I didn't have to leave that bridge. I kind of almost wanted that bridge to be the one thing that organized this whole complex because it's really complicated, yeah. And then, you know, even like in this rendering you talked about, like if the bridge came out, and I understand it's not four stories high at that point, but if that somehow could mark and then be sort of one of the, um, or a secondary key vertical gesture in this, just to get people to understand that this is about multiple levels and, um, you know, you can come here from, from coming off the street without a level, engage with us at whatever speed, pedestrian speed, vehicle speed, you know, it's you know we're 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 here. Waterfall is here for you to for you to experience. I can pass it. Um, I think you picked the most difficult site in all of BC. <laughs> <laughs> I know so that I know this because I actually taught a studio with this exact site, and it's finally <laughs> finally someone able. You know, like nobody under a master's thesis level can really try to wrestle this site. So I think you've done a really good job of trying to wrestle a site that has multiple levels, multiple obstacles, bridge, the freeway, you're above and below something. You're basically, a, you need to make a sculpture because you're you're working in all directions. Um, but I, I definitely, and I think you've made a, a lot of really, really good decisions. And um, among them, you know, the way you're connecting the upper and the lower and the way you're occupying these interstitial spaces. Um, and I think that you may actually have some like hidden drawing some there, somewhere or some kind of unfinished um, diagram that would show this, basically this public promenade sequence in, a, in, in three dimensions or something that could help us really see that sequence. And I think that would, um, but I agree, it could be that that's the place that there's a little bit of, there, there's, there could be more. Yeah. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I have a couple, I, I find this whole thing very difficult because it's so challenging to take art, which has like all of these other governing principles. And so I just really admire you for tackling this because it's not something I could see myself doing. Um, so I really appreciate it. And like all the architects here, we are all like so obsessed with Rothko. He's like one of our favorite painters from like, we don't know when and we don't know why. But I would say I I really like this analysis. Um, I keep squinting at it because I my eye doctor keeps telling me I need new glasses and I refuse because I don't want to get reading glasses and I don't want to, I know, I don't want to do any of those things. I know, Tanya, I don't. Um, <laughs> Like I refuse to get readers, but um, but what ends up happening, like, so I keep squinting at the 11 things, but I think my comment is, I have a question and then I have uh, three comments. So, but I'll lead with the comments. Um, one, I really like this idea of how you're tackling the complexity on multiple levels. I really appreciate how complex the program is, how layered it is. And I think the complexity of the site, the complexity of your program, there is something that I think could be strengthened, which is the simplicity of Rothko's, like the like if you wanted to say the diagram of his work, there's there are these layers of, of of his work. Like the immediate thing is so simple, right? It just looks so simple. And I think what's interesting, 
where you're starting to do that is in the facade, like you're simplifying and unifying the facade. But I would say the massing could actually be simplified so that there are these big gestures, which is why we're all interested in that waterfall promenade, literally just like dropping through the first floor and reading that figure. Because right now, like just architecturally, it's confusing because the elevator core, you think that's the waterfall from certain renderings. And then like the size and the continuity, like it makes sense logically, but as a figure, because he's so compositional, right? I think that that's where you're running into a kind of conflict, right? There's so much complexity in the site. There's so much complexity in the program. That in and of itself is is going to give you all the complexity and the layering you need. So I think the facade or the overall massing in your next iteration of it, if you simplified it and made those gestures almost like, like so obvious, that would really complement the, the complexity of everything else, right? Because uh, I think what Jeff said was true about you having done these iterations like hundreds of times. And I think it's because everything is so complex, right? So there are some parts of it where like it, in the case of the massing, you can just dumb it down and then that would read like the Rothko. And then I'm going to go back to my original focus on the analysis. I think it would be really helpful in this presentation and then also within the design process, if you were able to say number one, which is uh, like one of them is lighting, like I'm squinting, you can tell I can't read it, but I would love if you it. took those 11 things, thank you, you've taken pity on me. If you took <laughs> those 11 things and you were to say, okay, this is what blurred edges means to me in the Rothko painting, right? And instead of us taking for granted that we understand how you're defining it, first define it in the two-dimensional painting. Blurred edges means there is a solid field and then there's a boundary. And what this means is I'm transferring it into my facade or I'm transferring it, like what is the architectonic element you're transferring it into or using it as inspiration for? I would love that. So is it, a, is, it is the blurred edges directly influencing your facade? Is it influencing your massing? Is it influencing your program? Is it influencing your circulation? Is it inf influencing uh, the thresholds between one material or another or your construction assembly? Like, I think that that would be really interesting. Like negative space, you kind of talk about it, right? But negative space can be like red compositionally as the glass and the facade. It can be read as the space in between the masses of the buildings. It can be read as like your circulation spaces, right? And then you mentioned the threes. Like I, I was fascinated with the threes and I was like, oh my God, that I've never thought about that with Rothko, but there are these threes. And, and I was like, oh my God, that's why we like him because architects are obsessed with three, fives and sevens for some reason. And we hate twos and fours. Um, but so, right? And then- yeah, but, and then I would be interested if you're like, okay, I'm interested in the threes, but in Rothko, the threes are usually two big ones and one little, little one. And then, but I want to make three equal ones because of this. So does that make sense? Like, I think to me, that's where the the kind of heaviness of your uh, project is. And by heaviness, I mean the 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 work, the, the thought and the kind of the elaboration. And so that to me would be like the, the key diagram that maybe Tanya was talking about, right? This idea that these things are defined in painting and they have physical, compositional, they have characteristics, right? Because negative space can be anything. It's so it's such a capacious descriptor that I think if you tell us what it means in the painting and then how you translate it into the building through these architectonic elements, which can, again, I'm just repeating myself, range from program to composition to materiality to sequence to all these different things in those terms, I think that would be clutch. And then we would just get it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Definitely. Didn't you have a slide like that that you went by quickly? Wasn't there... A bit of a comparison. Um, I think I talked about it during each perspective and kind of how those many elements it's came back. Bubble, bubble oh, there is a sectional uh, key moments. I forget where it is exactly. But yeah, I decided to define um, not that each <clears throat> not that each key moment is unique to one certain aspect of the Rothko analysis. They all kind of blend together a few different of those key elements, but I agree that could well, be simplified. That's why I think, like, I think they're all, the 11 are all working at the same time in the building, but for me, there's slippages, right? Where I think we can be more precise. Keep going. 
Okay. I mean, this is a simple version of it, but I forget where the real one is. I think it's one of the circles. Yeah. I, I think it's a great it's question. I'm not, I'm not sure I agree there should be such a literal. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, you're ah, So okay. go ahead. No, after you. Okay. Um, there it is. Okay. You went by quickly, so I couldn't Sorry. remember what this was about. So key moments. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know if you should be that direct and prescriptive about each of the each of the things. I think part of the mystery. We're. It's very funny that we're all in love with Rothko, and none of us can articulate why. I think that's kind of where the project ought to land. Is that they're feeling like they're coming from a common genesis somehow, but maybe you can't put your finger on every single element. So. Well, I, I love this, you know, uh, track of critique. And so I wanted to keep going just a little bit. And I also, you know, I love Rothko and have, <laughs> have been looking at Rothko for many years. So just, uh, I, I, I just want to, <laughs> I, I just want to add a, a couple of things to the, the analysis that Irene got us going on. Uh, one important phenomenon of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Rothko's paintings is the compressed space. Everything is pulled onto one plane. And I am looking for a manifestation of that in your work. So I, I'm going back to my own education where we read an article by Colin Rowe and Robert Slutsky called Transparency Literal and Phenomenal. And we read it about 90 times because it was so hard to understand. But it talks about how architecture can function like an abstract painting and compressed space. And so I'm looking for more one point perspectives where we can see the layers of your building. You talk about layering in Rothko, where we can see the layers all compressed together onto one plane. I think that would be important. So for me, the angled perspectives don't do it. I would love to just see that procession, uh, you know, towards the building. So that's thing one. Thing two is there's almost always a horizon line in Rothko's paintings. And since you've got this great site with water, I would just love to see that, that horizon kind of coming through the, the painting. Uh, or the, the architecture. And um, yeah, I think that the blurred edge is just super important. It shouldn't be crisp. And then there's also that that um, uh, uh, painterly quality in Rothko where it's, it's kind of shimmering and undulating and it's so influenced by the ambient light. That was something in the Rothko chapel that just blew me away. I saw these dull paintings up on the wall and I thought, oh, I traveled this far to see that. And then I sat down and looked and the painting started to vibrate as the, you know, the sky changed. Mm -hmm. And so rather than seeing the dots, I would rather see different kind of light qualities and how it changes that beautiful material that you chose. You know, at night, it's gonna be a glow from within. During the day, it's gonna get some of the sky color some of the water, the bounce from the water. Um, you know, I, I really think you're onto something and I, I would have uh -huh. loved to, you know, uh, as Irene said, to see how you made a, a real translation from each of your principles into architecture. And then also just add in that kind of principle of um, flattening and, and draw the architecture in a in a well you know you even kind of painted that would be fun i, th I think you, I you I need to keep to. going with this um you know way of making okay since i'm on the committee i get a, a comment sorry <laughs> um well matt why don't you go on yeah um matt madlin put her finger on what i was thinking too about the whole transparency issue and if you think about modern architecture you think about two strands of it one is a kind of frontal layered space like Corbusian space and the other is the, the what they call the de style Mo uh, Moscow axis which is the two-dimensional you know um, seeing things on the angle Schroeder house and 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 um, constructivism and things like that and while I sort of can get interested in that you know as a kind of thing 
there. What what strikes me about one possibility that probably could have been pushed, and I think Madeline was 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 very articulate in describing this, but just to say one other thing about it, the site is extremely layered. It's it's and I think I would have anticipated more of a heightening of the layers of the site and continuities across it in the same way the paintings have the continuities across it. Because these paintings, I've never, you know, Rothko's great, of course, but they suggest a condition of frontality and implied depth to me, which which I think in architectural terms, what Colin Rowe and Slutsky were talking about was this idea of the sort of layered space and moving through it perpendicular to a sign of layers rather than on the diagonal. And so I might not look at that building and think there's a sort of celebration of that painter of that compositional as much as I think that's kind of interesting and a kind of tour de force there's a bit of a gap for me there in terms of that and maybe architecture is okay that way where you end up sometimes is different than where you begin but I think if you try and relate it back to those DNAs of modern architecture you may have ended up in a different place. So um, congratulations, Catherine. I wanted to add a few things. So Catherine began as my gallery assistant for the first year. Um, and uh, well, not only that, it was during COVID, so she hadn't ever entered the building, so it was all virtual. Um, and I think that's something, I, I really appreciate the conversation that your thesis has, has offered. Um, and the last question, you know, how close is it from our inspiration to the outcome? Do people need to see this direct connection or not? How much does it, when you translate to architecture, does it get shaped by the site that you've chosen, which clearly was a real character, right? This was not a neutral site here. Um, and the complexity of the building program that you've taken on. Um, you know that I pushed you for doing those kind of experiments and material experiments. And Jamie was saying, well, it's a really challenging project. She has to get a building out of here. So if you were to have a couple of more weeks, it would have been great to have seen that kind of, you know, experimentation and translation into a kind of material testing. Um, but you didn't get to that and that's okay. Um, I, I do think there might be, well, one of the things that I love about Rothko is actually imagining that I could look at them from the side, um, that I could imagine, I think about the layers of the paint and that the, the phenomenal quality that's created by the choice of color and the layers and the ultimately that they're within this rectangle. They're within this frame that we're not that aware of the frame when we're in front of them. Um, and and so it's this, this kind of buzzing kind of thing, this phenomenal thing, which is also one of the coolest things that can happen to us when we're in, in a building in space. And so my wish was that I would rethink the kind of renderings you're making. I would think about how you create images that somehow can communicate that sense of presence of material and of space and where those moments would be in this project and when, right? That sense when things are, you know, are just like, you know, shimmering, right, in that way. And maybe we had to see the same place twice, three times, four times. It almost has a filmic kind of quality to it. Because I think that's one of the atmospheric things that's that I think is present in your mind. And, you know, again, were you to, maybe that's something to play with because all of these thesis projects are beginnings and not endings um, as you move forward. Now I'm gonna rightly pass it to Jamie. Okay, um, thank you everybody. Um, I'm the chair, so so I get to, I get the last, last word, but really Catherine, you're the one who will be continuing forward. And I just wanna say it's been an inspiring journey um, you should be delighted with this, this dialogue today, because one of the things that you wrestled with and that we had much conversation about is how do you create a quote unquote professional distance between you and the architectural process and the art and negotiating that creative space that allows you uh, discretion and the use of intuition on your own terms relative to this art is uh, 
inspiring uh, to me. Um, so I've really enjoyed this journey um, and reflect on um, what we've talked about here. Um, I do just want to briefly acknowledge these elevations. Um, I think I think they capture many of the qualities that you set out to capture by not necessarily translating A to A or B to B. And we talked a lot about that. And by the way, I want to acknowledge your committee as well and 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 working with you, um, Ranit. Um, we, we, we talked a lot about art and architecture and what that relationship is. And I'm sure you're going to hold on to every aspect of that conversation, but here, here is the embodiment of that for, for all time, your thesis project. And so um, this is a great send off for you. It's been really a pleasure to work with you. And I wish you all the best as you move forward with your career and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>Okay, so um, we're going to hear from uh, Maria Farietta next uh, in Medellin. Um, just one observation about the four projects that we're talking about this afternoon. Um, they all represent infrastructures of a certain type, cultural infrastructure, other forms of infrastructure. And so I think thematically um, we can we can think of them uh, a little bit that way, but um, we're gonna hand it over to you, Maria, to hear about your thesis. Yeah. 
Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to first start off by thanking my thesis chair, Jordan, um, and my whole committee for being so supportive throughout this whole process. My friends, my family, I couldn't have gotten here without you all. So it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's been a challenge for sure. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking to you about social urbanism in Medellin. Um, and this is going to be through the focus of integrating the landscape, life, and culture. So we're going to look at um, a brief introduction to the project, um, a bit about the history of the location, um, some details about the context, and then um, the driving factors that guide this whole design and the design solution. Over the last 50 years, the city of Medellin, Colombia has experienced a drastic urban transformation. The drug war and armed conflict of the late 20th century exp expedited urbanization as people were forced to move um, from their rural, ho rural homes to seek shelter in major cities. So informal settlements are born out of necessity. Um, and these, this form of urbanization is actually the most common in the planet. So, um, it's, 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 uh, it's such an impactful topic that affects all of us everywhere in the world as the population continues to increase and space continues to, um, be more occupied. So, so, um, looking at, um, the, uh, example of Medellin, it's located in Colombia, right about the equator. And we are going to be looking at a site that is located in Comuna 13. The city is divided into districts. So um, we're going to be looking at one of them. Like I mentioned before, since people moved in as close as they could to the city, a lot of them ended up on the hilly um, mountains of the valley. So a couple months ago, I had the great opportunity to visit the site and engage with the people. And um, throughout this process, um, what I found was a really tight knit community of entrepreneurs and people that are really um, decided to make the most out of everything they got. They're very creative um, and very um, proud of their city how it has formed and what it has to offer to the world so um it it's a place where we bring together the formal and informal um it has multiple uh it has multiple spaces for engagement um it's and you'll see how its location allows it to be a, a true business incubator for the community um and provide multiple services for the community so Comuna 13 itself um, holds about 5.5 of the population of Medellin. Um, and the most common methods of transportation are by bus or walking or the Metro cable. Um, however, within the site itself, since the roads are very narrow, people mostly use motorcycles or walk. Um, like I mentioned, the history is is one to admire really um in over it's a very recent history over the past 20 years um it has seen a drastic change from being known as the most violent um city in the world to being a really popular tourist destination full of culture and engagement um so how does that really happen um over in that time period the um the efforts of the government, the mayor of the city, um, has had a huge focus on implementing social urbanism, um, which is to, to take the community as the basis of all the design decisions and to make sure that the projects that are implemented are prioritized based on the community's needs. Um, and more than their needs is looking at their assets as well. So, um, it, that's that's the whole intent. So it's not to take anything away from them, but to give more of what they already have and to um, 
continue to support the activities that they already engage in because they have been able to create like wonderful things in such a tight um, constrained space. So um, like I mentioned before, uh, one in eight people live in slums in the world. Um, in Medellin, the slums over time have become formalized. So they're not really considered slums. They did start out as being made out of um, shed and temporary materials, but over time they became more formal and they are fully um, supported with electricity, um, a water, sewage, all the basic services. So I think that's part of the um, order of things that need to be satisfied in, in these settlements. So um, since they already have services, basic services um, fulfilled, now the city can focus on engaging them to the rest of the city and providing opportunities for them to develop their businesses, to be get better life opportunities, and so on. So um, these are very vernacular methods of construction. Um, as you can see here, it's concrete floors, bricks on bricks, and shed-like uh, roof structures. Um, but this vernacular quality allows them to be um, kind of modular in a sense because they can, over time, it, and it's kind of the story of how that they started with more informal um, elements and then over time, um, making their houses bigger, creating another floor to rent or to create a restaurant or an art gallery. Um, so it's really like a stay in place, grow as a community type of um, environment. So um, this social urbanism and community development is um, involves the mayor of the city, the public private partnerships, and it's been um, it's been really a successful example through multiple um, entities in Medellin that uh, have taken charge of this. So the urban development organizations, they've created this prototype of building that's called the UVA. Um, and uh, here are some examples of what that's like. So these UVAs or unities of articulated life um, are, specifically designed to serve the community to bring access to technology, access to maker spaces, access to um, education, um, and also to provide multiple opportunities for young people to engage in sports so that they are not, you know, leading their lives in other directions. So it's just providing like a really holistic, comprehensive um, opportunity of access regardless of the socioeconomic status of the community. So. So that's the main focus. So we're going to look at the site itself. Um, this is a bit of the character. You can see a lot of the um, the floor levels are stacked. There's multiple overhangs and balcony-like type of spaces. Um, if we look at the context a little bit, we can see over here um, there's multiple stairs and different types of outdoor spaces where they make the most out of what they got. They Every corner is a stage, every street is a market, every um, every stair is also, uh, you know, an, an art gallery space where the murals of the place actually tell the story of their history of how they have progressed over time and um, really um, capture the character of the place. So. As you can see over here, um, the site itself is located right where the more regular city merges with the irregularity of the hill. And that's because of the topography, because it's a very mountainous space and people live everywhere they can. So, um, and we are in Medellin, Colombia, so the sun is everywhere all the time, but it's a really comfortable, um, out place to be outdoors. Um, it's not too hot, but it is sunny and very comfortable to be outside. So that's part of the goal of this project to create multiple outdoor spaces that are comfort comfortable for people because that's where they enjoy to be the most. <clears throat> so um, as you can see here, the typical neighborhood, you can see the types of um, circulation, very narrow streets, lots of steps, lots of stacked um, spaces. 
and intricate um, moments throughout the whole community. Um, and through the experience of being there, there is really just so much everywhere that you could go a million times and have a different experience every time. So the design itself, um, I'm gonna walk you through the design process, but it's more of a pavilion garden than a building. <laughs> Um, so that it really integrates with the context and with what the community um, already does and already um, experiences. So one of the main goals is to, to support art and tourism. So um, while I was there, I had the opportunity to interact with some of the graffiti artists and they are self-funded, um, but they are very, it's a very close-knit community. So they they make a very big effort to maintain their murals beautiful all the time. So they have to be repainted every one to three years. And since they're self-funded, the tourism that um, has been increasing in the area really um, allows them to keep doing more of what they love to do. So with this project, we really wanna support that. Um, second, we wanna increase connectivity since it's a very hilly site, it's very, um, important to connect the different um, levels of the site, um, allowing for more people, more tourists and more community members to go everywhere <laughs> because there is so much going on everywhere um, and engaging with some of the community members as well. They mentioned that it would be nice, it would be helpful if um, the tour guides would bring people to other places, not just the most um occupied routes so that everyone can make a business out of their home um and progress that way so we want to incubate local communities they they want they they have the ability to make every every corner a stage of entertainment um and with memorable experiences that um that make it very characteristic and unique so we want to increase the outdoor spaces and recreation spaces. So um, in the site, there was a futsal field. So we want to maintain what they had, but provide more spaces um, for people to engage, for people to set up their shops, um, for people to engage in sports, in arts, um, and so on. Since it is very sunny, it is important important to create a well-shaded space that um, allows for people well-shaded but also flexible so that if it's raining they can move inside but if it's nice outside they can just be outside as they as they like. So um, this project really uh, brings together the landscape, life, and culture because the landscape guides the orientation of the buildings. Um, and once the buildings are oriented on the site, it's the life that defines what those spaces can be. Um, and the culture is what happens in between all those spaces. So every surface can become uh, a park, every corner can become a stage, um, and the flexibility to have multiple types of spaces is um, a top priority. So if we look at the program a little bit closer, um, the the project has a culture and tourism hub allowing local um, tour guides to maintain control of that service for the public that's coming in um, and since it's very informal people are used to people aren't really used to coming into a place and just finding somebody to give them a tour um, but that is the way it works best because you get the most authentic experience from the locals from the people that have lived through this history because they're all in their 20s, 30s, so they've lived through um, the transformation of Medellin. So um, having a place that is in a central location where the um, regular grid of the city becomes more organic uphill um, allows them to keep the opportunity of keeping control of this service and continue to make um, a living out of it. This sports and recreation is continuing to focus on the um, engagement of the youth and making sure that they have um, safe and educational spaces to spend their time. 
um, and the community resources is to, um, since this place is so central to the rest of the city and to the comuna, it, um, it allows us to bring services for them. So um, wellness centers, classrooms, um, opportunities to develop their businesses, to increase their education and so on. So as you can see here, the lower area of the section is focused on those outside market terraces um, and the business incubators for the tour guides to continue to develop their business. The central area is the recreation focused on sports and engagement of the children. And the upper area is um, mostly focused on um, education and community services um, for the locals. So if we go through the plan, you see the tourism hub right at the front um, with flexible spaces, depending on the needs of, of the sizes of the groups that are visiting um, or the um, whatever activity they have going on. As we go up, we see those outdoor market terraces, um, an artist showroom. So since this mountain is so massive and so full of creative people, a showroom right at the entrance allows them to guide people to their art gallery. So it's an opportunity for everyone to get that exposure right at the front and to guide people to explore even more throughout the um, whole community. And the multipurpose arena, this is an indoor arena so that in case of rain or in case of large events for the community, they can use it as a, as a flexible space um, for multiple purposes. And then as we go up again, um, we find those community dedicated spaces. So since they're very artistic and they practice their dances for their performances, um, we have a, a, a dance hall, a gym, classrooms, maker spaces, computer labs, and so on. And then as we go up once more, you know, all these spaces are connected to the outdoor um, spaces below or outside. And we're gonna see, it, see that really well um, over here. So you can see how those places, how every space is connected to the next and is um, integrated so that you can see the activity that's happening right next to you and you can be intrigued to continue to move through throughout the building and um, hopefully enc encouraged to visit more of the comuna as well. So here we see that uh, focus on sportsmanship and the youth. Um, and over here we have the um, terrace market with people being able to set up their shops to sell goods. Um, and everybody engaging. So this this project really hopes to bring in the um, assets of the community because they their way of living, their characteristics and their creativity um, is is very inspiring and um, the, their effort to grow and continue to um, make the most out of what they have and, uh, make a living for themselves with their with their their place is um, what what brings this all together. So this this building, you know, provides a blank canvas for people to show their culture through the murals. Um, a meeting point for the tour guides to bring um, more groups to the rest of the site and um, multiple spaces for engagement of children of sports of culture and arts. So um, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you all. You talked about the area, but that this specific, why is this like really the perfect? Yeah. So um, I, like I said a little bit, so this place is where the regular city meets the informal city. Um, and as a central point, it's a gate point and a meeting way to um, really bring in those opportunities for the locals that they want to have even more so. With some of the um, social urbanism projects on the site, 
um, the it has become a tourist destination. So there's multiple people coming in all the time, and uh, the locals have really made an effort to, um, you know, make a business out of that. Everybody's an entrepreneur, and everybody um, decides to do something. So this site specifically, it's a gateway, it's a meeting point, and it's an opportunity to integrate both the formal, the informal, the culture, the tourism. Um, so that is, <laughs> did you remove buildings or no, no buildings are currently removed. empty. Yeah. So it's that space at the center of the circle, the white, the basically the, the white space around oh, the texture. Wow. Yes. And that's, that's roughly how many acres and what's the total topographic change? So the topographic change from here to here is about, um, 45 feet. Um, and, um, up here there is a pedestrian walkway and down here is the vehicular road so we really were working i was really working with a really steep topography so as you can see it was a really big challenge to create that connectivity yeah <laughs> it's really <laughs> so north is this way as well as it is in in the drawing so you so can this is, the, this is the north side yes and the topography, as I see it with this, you know, uh, organic topography, it's also moving up, but then it's also, you know, moving around. Yeah, exactly. So we start at the bottom of the hill and we go up the street at the street level, but we create that connection between the upper street as well. So, um, it's really, it's really making those connections through the outdoor spaces, the interiors, um, so that there is more paths and more places for people to do what they love. Can you also talk a little bit about the structure, the sort of superstructure you have? Yeah, trellis? so if you look at the um, community as a whole, there's a lot of colors, a lot of vibrancy. Um, and this copper patina um, shading structure, when we look at it from the street level looking up, it blends in with the way the um, existing roofs meet each other. Um, so the goal was really to be contextual, something that ages well, um, as there is a lot of uh, variety in the surroundings, um, and to provide shade, some some shade structure for the outdoor spaces. Yeah, so no buildings were knocked down. Right now, there is a futsal field, um, and Let's see. So there is a futsal field um, right about here. So um, and they have some spaces in the site that they use for performances. But a lot of it was um, underutilized because it, it was too open and they like closer knit spaces. So that's what I was trying to create more of, because the closer spaces that were existing on the site were really um, busy all the time. But the larger spaces weren't so. So that was the goal, just to create more of what they have so that they can do more of what they do. Mm -hmm. yep. It's about 10 minutes away from the metro. Um, and since bus is the, the most common way of um, transportation, the bus leaves you right here. So it's right down the street. This road is the last vehicular road that goes up the hill. Um, so it's a service road for the community only. Um, so anyone that comes here comes by public transportation and just goes and engages with the place for a minute. That's very helpful in understanding the orientation. So the reason that there is sort of a, you know. Th thank you for, for this explanation because it's a com very complex site. It's interesting that we have a project that, that has the same topographic uh, aspects of it, and you know, there's but there's a there's a specific there's a specific flow that's mm -hmm. beginning and a culmination in both of them. On the other hand, you have you have such a complex urban urbanized condition where um, you know I guess one of my questions was is is sort of the 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 uh, east west connectivity, but I guess that can happen through your building, so there's permeability. In, in, in all of them, even though you've created 
sort of larger scale space to give some breathing room. It's like introducing sort of some, you know, active lung, an activity center that's a larger scale to give some breathing room to such a compressed, yep. intense uh, urban experience. Exactly. That's the goal to have that flexibility, flexibility where people can be indoors or can be outdoors, depending on um, the weather, pretty much. The circulation inside the building, the vertical circulation happens in these two cores um, and all the levels connect to their surroundings. Since I have the microphone, I'll continue a little bit, um, <laughs> if you don't mind. You know, I think it's I think it's wonderful. You know, the the um, it, it's such a challenge globally, and it has been going on for a long time. I was thinking back to when I was in school here. There, Horatio Caminos had a program in at MIT for for many decades that looked at site and services to to address the problem of what was then called you know squatter settlements mm -hmm. and sp and sprawl. Um, had a negative term in thinking about the people whose whose lives yep. that were you know sort of in by circumstance um for a variety of reasons um brought them brought them to various places and, and started to increase urbanization mm -hmm. so i think it's a really uh wonderful thing that you're you're tackling this from you know in your in your country i'm glad to see i had a graduate student that that was here back in the very early 2000s and so to see the growth of what the city has been doing in the past 20 years yeah. has, has is really wonderful to see um i so i understand now better the sequence that it is sort of this flow from this central point of arrival in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, transportation infrastructure and it makes a lot more sense i also like the uh, I'm, I'm responding to the fact that creating this kind of communal activity at a larger scale is so important for a space that's in, intensely developed. And another observation, I can't help it but comparing um, with the great conversation that happened in the previous, that there's such an intensity of graphic uh, graphics and artwork that's created um, by the populace, mm -hmm. uh, very polychromatic, very dynamic, um, rather than serene. <laughs> so you're creating the sort of the serenity with your architecture where the converse the other mm -hmm. project was looking at complexity through mixed use to, mm -hmm. to, to, to respond to her particular and very challenging aspects. So I think that I can imagine that the surfaces that you've created are gonna provide the canvases exactly. for, for uh, additional community engagement when they come to this, and use this place. Yeah, so the uh, in the structure, we kept I kept the lower areas of the uh, building as those blank canvas walls so that people can continue to tell their story. Um, but I took the opportunity to make the upper spaces um, connect with those interiors so that they can use um, the space depending on their needs. Yeah. Um, well, I love thesis projects because they're I get to sit here and learn all these really amazing things and see these really beautiful places. And um, I really appreciate the uh, the way you rendered this thing in the center, your image right in the center, because I think it actually gives, uh, it, it sort of tells the whole story about architecture as the backdrop for mm -hmm. civic engagement. And, um, and, and so I really appreciate that. I think it's a really great way to tell the story um, and I think there must be something going on here where everybody wants to, or at least the first two uh, students really want to do something really challenging. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, you could have just picked something flat. Um, but I really appreciate these spaces. And what I, I guess what I wanted to get to is that I think I'm really curious about how the space is actually so you have architecture as backdrop, mm -hmm. but I also really want to see how the ar architecture operates. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so pleasantly surprised. With, well, at first when you said, oh, it's some pavilions, I thought, oh, no. I hope it's not just a couple of pavilions. <laughs> You're in trouble if that's the case. But it's this wonderful, large building. It's not a small set of pavilions. Um, and I would really like to kind of know a little more about how those um, small spaces work, because in the section... They, they sort of seem a bit more cellular than they might be. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the drawings are a little tiny. So my old eyes are, are also suffering, but you did, you do have nice drawings. I just can't quite read them. Um, I would also like to know 
more about some of the outdoor spaces mm -hmm. um, because I see some real, like, this is amazing. This kind of um, hard and soft scape. Um, yes, so since it's a like it's a really complicated topography, it's a really complicated site. And um my goal was to make it really accessible for everyone, which is something that's hard to find in these communities because they are so irregular. Um, but it is possible. <laughs> so uh, really taking that challenge on and making sure that it's a space that everyone can enjoy and um taking the topography as an opportunity to create these spaces so that they can be um, outdoor amphitheaters for people to watch performances, um, outdoor movie nights for the community um, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, yeah, I, I really try to make those spaces all very um, friendly, very comfortable to spend time on and to also lead to new ways. I want to challenge you with one more question and then yeah. I'll, I'll stop. Um, you said something about the, you know, thinking about the vernacular and that the, the sort of more or less the fenestration is reflecting that. Can you describe how the, how that, how you connected those two? Because, you know, I don't never been there. And to me, I don't understand those windows as um, specifically local. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, one of the things I noticed when I was there is that the local artists that have their galleries, they try to keep their spaces um, cooled <laughs> because they want to preserve their art. So, uh, but every everything else is really comfortable to be outside. So I saw that as a real um, opportunity to allow them to have those spaces to showcase their work right up at the front of the hill and to invite people to go up to their galleries throughout so um at the street level most of the walls are solid for the purpose of providing the canvas for the community but when we get to the second second and third <laughs> levels um above they become uh, more about the shade and the glass so that you can see that there's a space in there and you want to go in there and you want to see what's going on and you want to know more um which is to to increase that engagement with the community um, in those opportunities. So so they're not um, the large windows. I try to kind of hide them a little bit so that they're not the, um, you know, that the place still feels really contextual, but it's an opportunity to invite people to come inside the gallery, to engage more, um, or if they're inside to see that there's a market going on outside and stop by to see um, what they can purchase. So I think, yeah, some of those views up there show a little bit of that engagement and how you can um, create those connections between those spaces. Hi, Maria. Um, I had a, a question first. So like, I know you guys do this for the seminar part and then the building part. So I'm curious first, what in your mind was like one of the things that you discovered in the seminar mm -hmm. or the pro seminar part that you thought was really important to bring into the building and how did you do that? So a lot of my time was spent understanding the site and the culture and the people. Um, and I think taking the time to do that was really important because it um, allowed me to see how the how they work like the systems the networks that they've created within their community to see how to best support them with a place that can provide um new opportunities but not take anything away so that was a big a big you know goal to make sure that nothing that was already there to not disrupt anything but to rather support it in any way that the architecture could and I think for me, what would be like an interesting next chapter would be actually designing some test cases for what the artists, what the residents, what like what these different journeys might look like for them. So I know you have the walls for the art. Um, I know you have the gallery spaces for the artists. I know you have the tour guides that will be taking them and connecting them to the local 
neighborhood. Yes. And I think for me, what would be really interesting is, is if you actually started to give us the stories of all this research that you've had with these individuals, but these communities, what is it like for, you know, one artist who maybe has a wall display or another artist, which maybe is displaying in the gallery, but their children play in the, in the mm -hmm. different, if the different sports fields. I think for me, seeing how that how what you've set up is like a stage or a, a, a like a, a mixing ground mm -hmm. for all of these different opportunities would be a, I think a really interesting extension of your thesis project, yes. especially because you're so interested in the individuals, but also the community. And so um, I would also love to see, for instance, if you design the program of the gallery, like what are some local artists, like is the, does the gallery perform differently when it's in the certain seasons, uh, when it's rainy season or not the rainy season, um, are some of the programs for a year, like, are they sculpture? Mm -hmm. um, are there things that mix with um, the local, uh, like the local communities? Are there like festivals or holidays? And I think it's interesting. Um, we actually have a friend, I don't think you know this, but we have a classmate who works for the London tube station. And she is, uh, she, she does the art for the London tube station. So different subway stations, they have stops, but um, she works on what local artists or international artists and what projects get installed, but they're rotating. And so I think that there's an also, I think for me, I'd love to know more about this notion of time, right? And how this, um, how this, uh, social urbanism that you've created this center center point how it changes during the seasons or how it changes different to different communities or, or different times of year Absolutely. and uh i think that for me like just thinking about how you've created an organization for that spatially but you could also create like a an art program or some kind of uh structure because i think a lot of times that's what people like is they like to be able to plug into a structure as well so Thanks for sharing your perspective. Absolutely. Those are some of my comments. Yeah, is there, and did anything strike you or what yeah, connects absolutely. with you? Absolutely, I think um, something you mentioned is that you would like to see more of the connection between the people and the design. And I think every design decision was from a story from somebody that I yeah. interacted with. Um, and I, I wish it showed more then <laughs> because um, it really is like I had the opportunity to interact with a local vendor who stands in the street every day at the same place at the same time. Um, so those those stories were really, um, really interesting. Or the, the community member that lives higher up in the hill and doesn't have access to as many tourists and would like to. Or the tour guide that's working to get his licensure so that he can be a professional um, registered um, tour guide and continue to progress that way in his career. Um, or the kids <laughs> that play at the soccer field and interact with the tourists and throw a word in English and a word mm. in French because they're so used to people from everywhere coming um, that they're very, very active and very, very willing to interact with people. So um, really, those stories were really impactful for me. Um, and they, they did have a direct impact to everything. <laughs> yeah. And I would love to see how you represent those narratives, right? It, within the architecture, within the representation here, right? So you can describe a building through axonomic, uh, axonometric plan sections mm -hmm. and through renderings, but there's this huge part of your research, right? That lives through the building. But as you said, I mean, just like saying like, maybe that's artist and their kid and that is like a local, um, you know, soccer team or fut futsal team. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think to me, that's so interesting to think about how we can describe buildings through the human experience as well. And in some ways that connects the architecture and the decisions you make to the people, mm -hmm. um, because then that, and that helps us understand in ways that if we are not as architecturally trained, it helps a lot of people to understand the value of the, of the thing that you're building. Absolutely. And designing. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> uh, great work. I I, um, I want to focus on something. I think you have managed to simplify uh, a pretty complex site just sectionally, right? And that simplification gives it this kind of unassuming nature. It just feels natural, feels like appropriate, et cetera, mm -hmm. which is interesting because it disguises kind of the, 
complexity of how do you work along a sloped street? How do you how do you make volumes that are different heights, et cetera? So you've solved quite a bit. Um, I would love to see a companion drawing, which is through the street, looking in elevation, right, right against here. I get an impression of what that is from this great drawing on the upper left. And this one on the upper left kind of triggers something wonderful to me about the way these spaces, the way these objects stagger down the street. They get smaller and smaller as they come to the, to the west. They essentially could slip inside one another. And, and when I look inside the, uh, when I look at this drawing, the first, the, the one nearest us, you get the wall slipping in with an entryway. Adjacent to that on the right-hand side is a staircase going up parallel to the sidewalk. That could almost happen every time. And each of these elevated levels are eventually accessed by the public. So it's a pretty interesting conceit to, to use that as the diagram of how to circulate along the street and then parallel to the street to an upper level each time. It could happen four times. Yeah. It, it could be the way that you change from one larger shape to one slightly smaller. Actually... You slip in, they're, they're like drawers. They're like drawers sliding out and down and you get the void, yeah. you get the void between the one that's slightly narrower than the other. Um, I think that could be really elegant. Um, I don't think its repetition would be uh, harm. Repetitive. Yeah, I don't think it would be too repetitive. There, there's there's enough, but not too much, I think. Um, it's an interesting And way. I think creating those spaces in between is really valuable for the community. So yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so they don't um, have to circular around the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah, up they and across, up and across. From yeah. anywhere to anywhere. Building off of both of what you were thinking, I, I was when I was asking about the, cro the cross aspects of the site, mm -hmm. Because I see, you know, the, the, what I'm reading into what you're saying, the idea of maybe slipping these, which so this this circulation that's coming vertically in between the buildings mm -hmm. could actually open up a little bit and that you might have, you know, um, sort of different floor plates that sort of start to in, engage, you know, in these ways like you were you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And when I see the when I see programmatically, I mean, I'm assuming that you you actually said, you know, the community has needs for how you've labeled these spaces, you know, some dancing, community, maker space and all that. But the but the plans of it is sort of very tight. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of that needs to be fixed. And where is that placed? And that still allows the community to come and say, okay, we're gonna make our own maker space. Mm -hmm. We're gonna set up our own dance studio. And like you were talking about how the seasonal changes of the circumstance, I mean, it really means that you're creating these larger spaces that then has temporary infill, exactly. depending on the, on the nature of the program and as things change over time. So I'm just like piggybacking off of both of your your thing, but I mean, this nice sequence that has, you know, tied to the to the public circulation, the pedestrian circulation that flows down through. Then I see that you know maybe maybe that these cross pieces can actually open up into the building. Maybe they, if they can't be lit. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm seeing these as bearing walls. Maybe you need that, but there's other ways to maybe think about structuring that. Absolutely. Um, this, this is bringing me back to a wonderful trip I took to Medellin about 12 years ago. And um, so you've picked a site that's right on the cusp between the, the uh, formal and the informal. And what I noticed when I was there, things have changed a lot clearly, but when I was there, in the formal areas, mm -hmm. all of the retail and social life took place inside a controlled space, a mall. Whereas mm -hmm. in the informal settlements, there was vibrant street life. And in your photographs, you showed this wonderful street life. So I'm wondering if you could play up this idea that you're both and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, as as Jeff and and Bill were talking about, is there any way for you to really open the ground floors, make them permeable. So instead of those high windows, what if they were actually shops with doors, you mm -hmm. could throw them open, people could display their merchandise. It might not necessarily be individual stores, but it might be, you know, almost like market stalls mm -hmm. so that so that there was street life. And I don't really know what's across the street, whether, you know, uh, and, and I don't know whether it's a really like fast moving, um, you know, street that people can't cross, but it looks to me in your rendering like there are a lot of people walking in the streets. Yeah. So I wonder if, 
you know, if you couldn't like pass through on the ground levels, mm -hmm. as well as having those wonderful, you know, stairs up. And then there was just one more thought, and that was um, uh, in, in, you know, informal economies, things tend to progress from laying stuff out on the sidewalk to having a cart to having mm -hmm. a little store, you know, and a little gallery. So I wonder if there couldn't be more uh, of the kind of street vendors to, you know, give a sense that some of that vibrance came down from the mountain, mm -hmm. uh, while at the same time that, you know, the sort of formal, um, uh, you know, places that give dignity to the community uh, are coming from the more formal side. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really applaud the uh, the concept of this project that it's uh, you know, about the economic development, it's about the culture, it's about, you know, um, bringing, bringing people to understand the culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all I'm looking for is just, well, could you do this and that and a little bit Absolutely. more to push, to push your ideas forward? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that street, that main street is very pedestrian. It, uh, it, it's only accessed by service vehicles. So like only the trash truck would come in once a week for, um, getting trash down from higher up uh, the street, but it's very like people make, people take over the space and make it their own um, everywhere they go. So um, hopefully you can see a little bit of that here. It's some residential looking houses, but they're businesses for people with the lower levels being shops, restaurants, uh, markets and in front of the shops, there's people selling stuff as well. And in the street, across the street, there's a performer um, creating more activity and more dynamism everywhere. So it's, it's really, really intriguing how those dynamics work. <laughs> I'll just say two things. The, the first one is I, this project feels like, like it should just be here. You know, I mean, you know, it's like, this is what the town needs. This is, a, you know, it creates, um, it provides so many spaces and begins to give people uh, a different way to think about place, a different way to, to recreate, you know, uh, organize where the kids will play. You begin to bring in uh, sport and exercise into this, and you're really thinking about also addressing the health of the community mm -hmm. uh, through recreation through business and all these opportunities. I, so I really love that this is, you know, in your imagination. And also I love that this is in your heart to do this. I can, you know, really feel you um, connected to this. One, you know, I'm, I come from the working worlds and, you know, in, in the field. So my comments are a little bit more practical, you know, on the, on the practice side. Um, you have a, you, you've used the trellis as kind of this sort of um, way to, to soften the edges, but also it's a way to sort of demarcate the ends of these large, massive programs, mm -hmm. large, you know, big structures to, to for 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 big things that are happening. Um, and um, but what about is there a specific reason that you did not extend the trellises on the other side, which is the pedestrian side? Everything is very towards where I'm standing, where I'm sitting right now. But if I look at this side here, it's almost like nobody gets any trellis. There's nobody gets any of that, that shading. And maybe talk a little bit about, about yeah, absolutely. So, your reason for that. Mm -hmm. The yeah. <laughs> I speak in simple terms. <laughs> yes, but, yeah, right. But, but I guess the point across, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I want to walk this side. No one's getting me. I don't get any trellis over there. So, so you're absolutely right. I think both sides of the street. <laughs> Both sides of the street could benefit from that shade. I think the thought process behind this was to create a rhythm of the entrances to the building. Um, so there's an entrance right here, mm -hmm. there's an entrance right here, and there's an entrance right here. So to kind of guide in disguise. <laughs> um, so that um, so to create that sequence and to bring people in, to bring people to the higher levels. Um, so I, those... Yeah. I would guess that these buildings, though, are also part of the informal economy, and yep. are, I could be all wrong, though. Um, I don't know what that pedestrian site is like. Yeah, they are um, all. But, um, yeah. I kind of would like informal. maybe to sort of, you know, show some love on that site too, because mm -hmm. I think I think that 
it, you know, it's not just the one side, you know, you, when I, when I get into the, the informal aspect of the city, it's like, I might decide on one morning to come this route or that route, you know, and I might go with my friends on the other side because I don't want to see my parents on this side, you know, all those kinds of things I imagine teenagers thinking and, yep. and, and enjoying and wanting to do. And so, Absolutely. You know, I, would, so I would offer that. I think right now as the site is today that site is more residential because it's higher up mm -hmm. but with the connections that i'm creating i'm hoping to bring people up so that they can make use of that space so that there can be more circulation so that street vendors can benefit from standing up there as well well almost as if it was always like this diagram like if you yeah. if you decided to make this more permeable than you, mm -hmm. then the pressure or the responsibility to sort of articulate that segment. I, I just thought. got a, it's such a beautiful- It's story. stunning. And, 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 you know, so there's an aspect of understanding the character of the feeling, even though it's a watercolor, mm -hmm. but, but aspects of, under, you know, what is this just being, just being uh, mentioned about, you know, really understanding the character of this street elevator, the container mm -hmm. of this great space that you're creating. and. And um, both either programmatically or at least visually, you know, the texture, the colors, and the vibrancy, because it sets your project apart. But then that's such a that's such a powerful image, and it's just beautiful rendering. Maria, oh my goodness, well done. Um, it has been a journey um, with Maria, an amazing student. Um, there have been many tears and many nights of pulling out hair dealing with this site. And this has to have been one of the more challenging sites that um, I have ever seen in a studio or in a thesis student. Um, your ability to navigate this, solve the problem. And then you had this motto of first do no harm, right? Um, you're love for this community, your willingness to go down, talk to people, and kind of design from the ground up. This is really a grassroots project. This is urbanism that is in context and in context with culture and people and what their needs are. And you've managed to, I don't know, triple, quadruple the amount of outdoor space, recreation space, walls for art, gallery, um, as well as vertical and horizontal circulation. So you're solving a very um, technical problem here um, and you've done it with aplomb. I'm so proud of you and I just want to acknowledge the rest of the committee, Clara um, and Michael, Michael Abrams and Clara Irascabel. Um, you have done well, Thank you. congratulations. Thank you. Sorry, pretty much. <laughs> Hold on. Um, this lady spent the better part of a year in a body cast and did this project while convalescing. That's how that render happened. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, um, Maria. Um, we're going to take a minute to uh, rotate the boards and reset a couple of projects, our final two projects of the afternoon. Yes. Illustrators, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, everybody, if we could uh, reorient ourselves to the west wall. The west wall, yes. Bring your chairs if you like those. Okay, so we're coming back stateside to uh, to Baltimore for this next project. And so Liam, uh, we're gonna hand it over to you to hear about Highway to Harvest Way, re-imaging Baltimore through urban agricultural infrastructure. All right. Get a stopwatch here. All right, welcome everyone. My name's Liam Jones, and today I'd like to introduce you to the Harvest Way. So Earth is seeing exponential growth in population uh, and that exponential growth is putting a lot of pressure on the built environment it's expanding to levels that we haven't really seen up until the modern era and this is threatening food production for an increasingly reliant global community i hope so testing awesome all right thank you guys so as I was saying, uh, this thesis is aiming to try to uh, look at the American food system and the relationship between rural and urban communities to try to redefine the paradigm of food within cities. So from this thesis, it stems from two core ideas. Food is commerce, perpetuates displacement, and growth can ha be done through decay. So humanity has moved through the earth following food flows and following the uh, patterns of which migratory uh, food systems have crossed continents, uh, so much so that in the United States, we see uh, early settlements and early peoples start to settle the Chesapeake Bay region uh, because of its uh, food-rich regions. And this became a source of nutrition for the first peoples. Uh, and this is where hunters turned to gatherers, and they started to work symbiotically with the uh, environment and with the earth that they lived within. Uh, they found a balance between the system that they had with the land and stewardship to sustain themselves what they needed for food. This changed drastically uh, when uh, European settling happened and uh, came towards uh, North America, where food was not looked at as something that can uh, be symbiotic in relationship, but it can be something that uh, can be used as commerce. And through that commerce, uh, we started to exploit that land and uh, we tr started to displace people disproportionately. The first peoples that were here that relied on that land were pushed out from their early settlements to uh, have that commerce move forward. And then also uh, people were further displaced to try to further uh, expand that commerce through the slave trade, especially here within the United States, which leads us to the uh, sort of modern fabric we see in a roundabout way. Uh, we see sort of this continual displacement happen because we're so focused on commerce. We're so focused on this idea of further reinforcing displacement, so much so that our urban fabric is shaped by the commerce flows through cities rather than trying to sustain a healthy, 
habitat for people living within them. Uh, so this is Baltimore in 1964, before urban renewal. As you can see, uh, it is a complete fabric that extends with uh, many courtyard style construction types. This is in 1972, after uh, highway projects started to ravage the United States, uh, including Baltimore. And what uh, we see currently are scars that are found not just here in Baltimore, but throughout most uh, urban settlements within the country. Um, and these scars had an impact. Uh, those scars took out 10 city blocks, 971 homes, 62 businesses, but moreover, it displaced 2,800 residents that were a vibrant community of mainly African-American uh, people who lived within the city's edges. And this scar was done to try to perpetuate commerce from the civic core of Baltimore out to the suburbs when the transition happened uh, during World War II and people were sort of moving away uh, so infrastructure was made to facilitate that transition between uh, urban and rural. So we're left with this current landscape, uh, something that is jarring, something that is dividing a uh, community in two. Um, additionally, we're left with an environment that is slowly receding. So uh, Maryland is a state that relies heavily on agriculture. Around 25% of Maryland's land use is actually dedicated to agriculture. Yet, oddly enough, 98% of our food that we consume within uh, Maryland is actually imported from a greater region. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening is uh, food is being used as commerce and uh, it is not being used to feed people. We can see this through metrics as well. This is a uh, food analysis study that is done throughout all the United States that measures food insecurity rates. And food insecurity is the measure of uh, the ability to provide nutrition for uh, a family household daily. So Baltimore is rated fairly high in comparison in all of Maryland at 15.5% of people. They are considered food insecure. And that is a metric that combines both the ability to get access nutrition and poverty rates. So what's interesting is if you start to look back at the history of how Baltimore developed is uh, that food insecurity centers around areas where there was Hulk maps and there were uh, the black butterfly within Baltimore. And uh, you can see that that infrastructure that uh, started to carve is also situated within those similar areas. So this is sort of a targeted systemic issue that grew from uh, this need to transition land use through uh, commerce rather than through uh, a, a systemic uh, symbiotic relationship with the land. So Baltimore itself as a city has a lot of different uh, pressures when it comes to food. Most of it is in, uh, coming through uh, either the highway network that is existing or from the shipping channels and rail that is sort of uh, revolving around this. And what we can see here is there's disparity in uh, the land that is being used to move the food towards the center to feed the most people. And also uh, the uh, way that this transit network starts to carve and separate uh, so as we can see, there is this transit network, and we're going to zoom in right here in this part of the uh, transit system, which is the highway to nowhere. As you can see, if we start to peel back some of the layers, uh, the network is not evenly distributed, and it's starting to exacerbate issues uh, where uh, land that the most people in need of food are the ones that are being least serviced by uh, different uh, types of food commerce buildings, such as urban farms and also through community farming, as well as uh, different uh, uh, grocers and other restaurants. So what is the physical context? So that sort of leaves us to the scar that's visible, uh, not only on the ground, but also from that 10,000 foot level where there's a division in the city through infrastructure. And this is what we're going to start to look at. So this is the highway to nowhere where there's portions of it that were sunken and there was portions of it that was raised where uh, the dirt that was moved to excavate uh, were used as spoil to build up a bluff. But as you can see, this decay didn't just happen instantaneously. Uh, down at the bottom graphic here, you can see that there is a, a color code and uh, what is in the most saturated red is things that were immediately displaced. But then there's decay over time because of this impact that this infrastructure had on this community that was here from the I-40 leaving us to sort of this uh, odd uh, construction 
within the urban fabric where we have block inventories that are very, very uh, less dense and also incohesive because of the infrastructure through erosion and otherwise. Uh, leaving us to have these separated communities and these odd edges where everything feels very liminal, everything feels uh, very disjointed, and also a topography that is uh, that has been ravaged through infrastructure itself. So this is the highway to nowhere. It is 55 acres of land. Why here, though? Why are we looking at this specifically? Well, there are a couple of different uh, major influences. There are uh, educational institutions here, such as Augustus Fell Savage and uh, Francis M. Wood High School. There are lots of cultural identity objects, such as uh, churches that service the local population, and there are also uh, these inner block courts, such as Harlem Square, Lafayette Square, and others that start to surround this. Uh, so we're looking at a situation where we have 55 acres of land, a very, very steep topographic change where there's a literal division between North and South Baltimore and a very heavily eroded decayed tooth structure where even the, the blocks that are there, half of it is uninhabited. So this is a very uh, systemic issue. But what we need to remember is there are still people that are living here and they are strong and resilient. There's chance to bring uh, a little bit of life back if we start to think critically about this decisions that we made and how can we grow from that decay if we reinvest. So I propose sort of a new paradigm, a new paradigm that is focused mainly on the distribution of different uh, types of uh, different types of methods of growing and different types of methods of manufacturing food uh, to distribute. As we can see, the quality and nutrition of food starts to decay as we move along the urban transect. Production is uh, restricted to those rural environments and then where people are most part properly dense, uh, food has to travel those miles and it loses nutritional value and it also impacts the carbon emissions as food moves along that. So what I'm proposing is sort of a new paradigm on food. Why are we doing this where we have a production center that is not scaled to the uh, communities it surrounds? Uh, if we can start to analyze how the programs of spaces are being used and embedded into a community uh, to give back, to create amenities, we can start to give back to the community. Uh, so additionally, there is a uh, notion that the way we use the land is important too. So monocrop cover farming, which is 25% of Maryland, it only can serve as 102 people per acre. If we were to say here in Baltimore, we're gonna do 55 acres, we're gonna service about 5,000 people. Uh, currently there's about 93,000 people who are food insecure, so that doesn't quite work. Additionally, if we go the other way of the scale and say we're gonna do very intensive vertical farming that is very resource intensive, but can service everyone, we can have a surplus of food for those people that are food insecure. So we need to find a balance between that to be able to meet the needs of the surrounding communities, leading to the existing conditions where we have this trench uh, that separates uh, two uh, different communities to the North Harlem and to the South Poppleton. So, I started to sketch and try to think, what can we do at an urban fabric level to try to change this? Uh, one of the starting ideas was sort of having a infrastructure that is embedded in this trench, trying to make use of the fabric that has been lost and grow vertically, uh, and also create sort of these moments of cultural identity uh, through placemaking, uh, having the landscape actually start to uh, uh, peel and uh, make note as to ways to interface with this is critical. Uh, so looking at what uh, tectonics of Baltimore really are. So the Phoenix Shot Tower is a icon of uh, sort of Northwest Baltimore. Uh, and it is also known that uh, Baltimore is known for like the sort of very brick uh, faced buildings. So what we're gonna look at is sort of my attempt to grapple with a lot of these systemic issues and also uh, we're going to see uh, sort of the amenities you can embed within infrastructure rather than having infrastructure separate amenity. So this is uh, the harvest way. This is a portion of the harvest way. So currently we're looking at a figure ground with that erosion. And the proposal is to start to create courtyard blocks that uh, start to infill and uh, reaffirm some edges within the community. Uh, laced with this uh, connective tissue that starts to 
bring people along and allow them to travel along with us. So we get sort of this distribution of uh, typology through civic, educational, and productive uses uh, that start to create these uh, different clusters. But all along this, we need to also embed amenities. Uh, and I think that to do so, we need to think about the three minute walk uh, to have moments of experience along that infrastructure to uh, not only have it there at service, but have it there amplify the space. Uh, we also need to think about how it would start to interact at a, uh, a skyline of Baltimore itself. Uh, to tr so I did an analysis to see uh, what different icons of Baltimore are so you can start to uh, understand where you are, not just in relation to the neighborhood, but in relation to the city, if you see these vertical moments. Uh, so we have moments of congregation, cultivation, innovation, and foraging through the program that's being distributed along here. And we're really gonna focus on these three blocks. So again, these are the existing conditions compared to the new proposal. And this new proposal is intertwined by that connected tissue, which is acting as a boardwalk for people to uh, sort of inhabit and live. And it has uh, different public amenities and uh, public transit options, such as the proposed red line for Baltimore and uh, a bike network. So we're gonna be looking at G3, M2, and C3. So this is uh, G3's existing conditions compared to the proposal. So infilling and trying to respect the height qualities of the, the surrounding context while embedding the infrastructure uh, underneath. This is looking at M2, which is a market hall as well as a cultural tower that acts as a space of placemaking so you can away find throughout the city. And uh, looking at a sunken orchard which uh, retains the existing depth of the highway to nowhere. So it acts uh, as a memory of what once was. So what's connecting all this? Well, it's a boardwalk uh, style that uh, starts to weave in and out, not just along, but through the building structures as well. And there's uh, different stratums within this boardwalk. So this is sort of the main public avenue uh, that you would walk along, but directly next to it, uh, you would find sort of these embedded uh, community garden spaces that uh, Harlem and Poppleton would be able to use um, that also you could find synergies between the different surfaces for things to grow along. And also uh, a moment of uh, edge condition, which allows for uh, people to interface if they want to, but also feel safe within that space because with such a degraded, uh, uh, urban fabric, there are uh, issues of safety you need to consider. Uh, so how did we get here from a form perspective? Sort of with that courtyard style block condition, it's uh, eroded to allow this uh, sort of visibility through and uh, had uh, connections weave through it before showcasing the uh, actual systems of urban farming within this space uh, and then matching the topography and allowing uh, the landscape to sort of grow over top and spill into the building itself. So if you were to sort of walk into this space, you would go from a moment of openness to compression uh, before actually entering showcase gardens where this boardwalk sort of codes you as you move through this space. So you can see the public realm and walk along it and see the food that is sustaining your community while also being non-intrusive to that food production before also looking to your right and watching this transit network rush past you and the landscape spill down into this cavern, which otherwise you would perceive as a building itself. Um, and then this is sort of that experience of the worker where uh, you would be in these grow houses where there'd be leafy greens and other uh, vegetated uh, produce that is being uh, grown through aeroponic systems. So how does this work? we have sort of this lowest level, which is sort of the heart of the project where you have that distribution, the production and the education components uh, that start to slowly grow out of this cavern uh, where you have a critical moment in the center, which is this sort of jewel box grow house that is seen throughout and people interface as an exhibition uh, as they move along the topography. And this is a very challenging site for topography. So uh, moving along it means that in some instances it is a level lower compared to where you're interfacing and other parts of it. Uh, before moving upwards where you have more of an administration and research uh, uh, components to the uh, different 
uh, typologies that are there before finally having this cohesive block building that on the exterior is non-intrusive on the urban fabric it's trying to infill. To be able to try to uh, connect people through transit corridors, uh, to allow people to have equal access and value, not just here, but through the city as a whole, uh, through trying to create systemic change in the grow houses of uh, production, and also to embed the uh, services within the ground which is existing and uh, allow it to self-sustain itself, but also to provide a place for people to work and play within Baltimore is critical, not just here, but in the entirety of uh, sort of the United States urban development fabric. We need to really think critically about how we feed ourselves in cities, how we feed ourselves in communities, and also how we start to question what can we do to this infrastructure to start to bring people back and sustain ourselves in the future. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open up to conversation and discussion. Thank you. Power. Yes, I of mean, course. Uh, it is a lot uh, to digest, and I'm excited to go through it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's three different instances of these culture towers. Uh, in some instances, they could be used as observation posts. In some instances, they could be used as vertical grow conditions uh -huh. where uh, you start to sustain uh, uh, different food production. In other instances, they're uh, different uh, uh, sort of landmarks for how you know how to interface. So over here, which is towards the western end of the highway to nowhere in Route 40. Uh, this is a uh, culture tower marker that is starting to showcase where a uh, pop-up market would be. Mm -hmm. And another additional uh, culture tower would be at the very center, which is in uh, sort of the shadow of the sunken orchard. And again, it's another market, but also would be used as a uh, exhibition for growing. And then there's a third one here, which uh, is aligned to the axis of MLK. Yeah. So uh, you'd be moving through uh, your different transportation avenues and sort of wander along it in this built-up bluff. Um, again, they're all acting as markers and uh, markers. They are sort of there for the people to inhabit, live, grow, and sustain. So, wow, wow. Um, I feel an obligation to speak first. That's because I'm probably the one from Baltimore in this, <laughs> um, in this panel, and it is just incredible to see what um, is a well-known disaster come back to be something that's actually practical and usable. Um, I just have some questions more than uh, anything right now. Um, you zeroed in on a couple of a small area because um, G2 and G, I think G3 and, and the M2. Tell us a little bit about some of the other program that you imagine would happen for the rest of the, to complete the 55 acres, because it's, I think that is also important. I mean, this is for anybody who does not know this, this is a, a tremendous wasteland. This thing um, separated communities, and it. Uh, I used to actually take one of these streets as a shortcut to get to work. So I mean, I I passed this thing daily for about eight years, and it is 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 something. Yeah, of course. Uh, so there's a couple of different clusters of uh, uh, different typologies. So this would be uh, the production component, essentially, where it's mainly focused on. Uh, the, the grow houses, and that would be G series. And right here in the center is where there's that transition from more of a industrialized style uh, growing and sustaining to a showcase before moving on to an educational component. Because it's important to not only be able to grow and provide, but it's also uh, important to be able to elevate people who are there and give them opportunity to interface with this. Uh, because if you just introduce uh, we're going to say we're going to do urban farming here. You need specialists. You need people who are able to uh, understand the qualities of food and why it is important. So there's an educational campus that would be sort of this in between okay. before receding back into MLK, where it becomes more of a park like setting where there is an overpass 
uh, and it goes into the commercial core. I might jump in first, be a, a more a talk first as much as Irene, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I just want to say thank you. This is like so. Uh, I really appreciate the walkthrough. I feel like I, uh, you were really, really clear and you, right before you jumped into the, I, I mean, if I were voting on like for a mayor, I'd say, yes, this is, you know, if I'm on the council here, let's do this project. It sounds really, you know, so you, it's, it was really convincing and um, informative at the same time. I have a couple of questions. My first question is what, I think you said it, but I want to, I might be setting you up a little bit. Um, uh, what do you, if you were to take away the highlight here, like if it wasn't bright green and this was just a regular, like the regular map after everything was said and done, what would you, how do you want it to be connected or reconnected? I think I would want it to be focused on more of that pedestrian uh, transit corridors. That's what really is linking everything together. Uh, but those transit corridors would have to be buffered in a way where it's also providing production. So this is sort of a section, I guess I could point to the monitor, it's probably a little bit easier to see, um, which showcases the in-between and sort of this boardwalk work and play. That is sort of that tissue that links everything together. And the hope would be that you do it well here and it could eventually grow to the communities beyond. Uh, because it's not just here which is eroded. It's most of Western Baltimore, unfortunately. But what you need to do is you need to have thoughtful intervention to uh, start that process of investment, to be able to connect to the inner courtyard block. So I could potentially see a future where this is linear right now, but maybe becomes more of a, a root system network that extends north and south. Well, so I will follow. Thank you. I was going to say that I, again, I really appreciate the the sort of local, regional um, project and one that's taking, you know, something that's a really, a really real problem with some really real, a really, you know, dream, but really real, potentially real proposal. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's wonderful. I want to ask about the cultural tower. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, I mean, you're making an iconic thing. And so, you know, why does it look like that? Why does it have to be that? Could it be any other? You you said a little bit about the, I'm just, I'm not saying it can't be. I'm just curious why you would, why you chose. Yeah. So I sort of chose that. something that would start to express that seasonal change. Uh, so right now I'm showing this in sort of like idyllic conditions of like sort of those months where it is able to be grown between March and August. And uh, those different plantings would eventually fall off and you would see sort of this exposed steel structure and uh, sort of this brick batter, which sort of gives you a sense of uh, change, but also uh, it gives you this sort of transparency. Uh, the goal is to sort uh, start to allow this to uh, move with the seasons and also to have uh, a way to be as an identifier. It needs to look unique and different, yet also relate to the context. So the Phoenix Shot Tower is a uh, brick built uh, 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 tower that was used for uh, the Civil War period where they would actually cast lead balls. And it is one of the only surviving ones in the United States. Um, but it has a very unique shape and it is sort of this icon. And I think if you were to create a shape and icon here that is sort of uh, unique and everlasting. It allows the system to be resilient in a way. You'd have sort of that identifier um, and that, that uh, placemaker where people could recognize and identify with it, uh, but it doesn't need to necessarily look like this. I think you brought up a great point. Uh, the, just because this is the way it looks doesn't mean that is what it would end up being. Um, I was envisioning something that would be bold and different. That's the, the goal with this. So something bold, something different, and something that indexes 
Index time is change. Change. Interesting. Great proposal. Um, I actually have a friend who's in the business of growing plants indoors, and you you showed a multi-level building that uh, when you then focused on your major design effort, it was I think is more about the show house rather than the grow house, right? But I think this grow house is pretty interesting to explore, um, partly because of the question of what urban edges have you created once you're done? So you have filled in a, a gash that everybody agrees is terrible. But when you cut that section, and that, that's a pretty fantastic section for occupying, I believe, as a, as a building on the inside. But I'm worried that you might have kind of blocked the north-south uh, interactions of buildings, the existing houses on the south, the existing houses and buildings on the north, the existing parks, et cetera. You show that great series of analyses of where are the parks, where are the churches, where, where are other things. I almost want to see them all back in here because I'm afraid that because of the length of these buildings and in that section and in this elevation, you're generally creating big blank brick walls. And rather than being able to create a bit of a two-sided street, and I don't want to be overly optimistic, it looks like it looks like the existing houses are townhouses facing streets that run north-south. So you're getting an end condition in many cases anyway. So I don't want to be overly optimistic, but it feels like to me that you ought to integrate something at the streetscape on the outer edges of this thing that face the street. That engage the street. And yes, you probably still need some larger solid walls, but programmatically, if you could insert something that could be alive one day, um, I, I think it's, it's you, you're adding back in something that's so important about feeding the people in this area, but I'm afraid that urbanistically, you're adding something that's a little bit fixed. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a challenge that I've been grappling with this whole semester is I'm not an urban planner. Uh, I have a background in- You're not? No, just, I have I'm a background- I'm just joking. <laughs> I, None of us are. <laughs> I uh, have a background in building science, sustainable design. And that was my undergraduate degree. And building I, sciences and what? And sustainable design. Oh, that's um, right. And my goal was to start okay. to look inward and ha see how it affects the edges. And if I had another- two, three years, four years. I'd love to start to try to understand those edge conditions, but I think it's something that not one person should have a say to. Um, with a proposal like this, development like this, you need a, a, a team that is able to bring in those different insights. And that is something that would be wonderful to have. Yeah, just to tag on. So I, I know you. it's pretty heroic to try to solve all that, but just noting noting that you know that's an issue you're dealing with and maybe you just do it on the corners of the cross streets or something like that the other question that i think is related to that and even if you're not an urban planner it's kind of implicated here it's a lot to assume that this would all be done at once and so where do you start and when you start in one location perhaps on the east perhaps closest to the city i don't know um you could you could see something over time where people start to catch on, people start to appreciate this new environment, the neighborhoods improve, and then you could extend it. I think it'd be interesting to see a kind of strategy about when to build what. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had a question. Um, I have two questions, but the first one is the grow house cultivating systemic change. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some like bullet points or high points about what the systemic change you're trying to cultivate is? Yeah. Uh, so I am trying to foster a place where it not, doesn't just feed people, but it gives people opportunity. It gives people the ability to learn those technical skills and have more of an economic impact as well. Um, Additionally, I'm trying to uh, cultivate a new perspective, trying to showcase that it's possible here um, in a challenging site, in a place that needs a lot of work and also has been looked at fairly thoroughly otherwise, mm. is 
a way for people to sort of pick up the torch in the future, potentially, and, and look at it more uh, fixed and to try to cultivate that systemic change. It, it has to start from a big idea and say there's issues with this. It's not the way to do it, but it's a start and it's something that needs to happen. Yeah. I mean, I think I have a comment in general about thesis. Like, I think there's this underlying idea that you have to solve things with thesis or you have like an answer. But I think if you if you look at the kind of way I understand research, it's and maybe this is more aligned with your past degree, is that I really am admiring how all of the projects I've seen so far, everyone is addressing an issue. And I think that's where the value of this kind of work comes in, is that you're addressing a a particular situation as opposed to trying to solve for it because if the entire like discipline of urban planning and you know public public governance can't solve that problem right away it's really it's it's so lopsided to think one person can but you are as an intellectual person able to address it so that's kind of one comment i have about thesis and the sort of things we think about it um i also wanted to echo this idea of like I think you can be heavy handed here where you're literally you're, you're taking a hole and you're plugging it back in, but the plug itself is a plug mm -hmm. as opposed to like a vehicle or switch or something like that. And I think that's maybe some of the comments that we're interested in is how do you have this thing infill, but also stitch back things from the community. And I think one of the ways is actually inverting our kind of typical way of thinking of like how programs stack. So maybe thinking of the first floor as the street level floor and then going down, like kind of like, an, I don't know if you've ever seen like an Indian step well, but it's like, it's a, it's a well cut into the earth that like goes down toward the water, but it's like ground zero is like at the top. And then you move down into, into the, into the earth, because in some ways you're creating like this, like dual public plane. Right. But in reality that the, the sunken stuff is still more, private more contained it's still it's more it's not as fluid or as porous as the rest of the city um and i would say that uh this reminds me a lot of like i wrote down like kind of two press it's like an inverted high line but then it's also um it reminds me of this project in valencia spain um and so it's this beautiful project that they converted um, an old moat, like moat or river. So there's an old, like uh, ancient or like medieval city, and it has like the Val Valencia has the middle core. Then there's this like river that is around the old city core, and then there are these all these bridges, and then all the rest of the city, like the interior city and the external modern city, is all on the upper levels. And then um, to control flooding and all these other things, they and eventually like changing water flows, the river dried up. And so it was a riverbed and they've turned it into like a park. And it's really interesting because I think that there are parts here where um, maybe we can learn like, like well, that's not Maria's project anymore, but the idea of like the steps, I mean, what's interesting about the Valencia project is it has these like ancient like boat launches and like um, that like literally just go into the water, into the old river and people jog up a, up them some of them are stairs but you're on this entire green green ring around the city that they've turned into a park and it's cool because you're like jogging or walking and you're going under these different bridges and there's like the 1890 bridge there's the 1287 bridge there's the like 1920 bridge and it's just an amazing way of seeing the history and acknowledging that and I think maybe there's something in your culture towers that you're interested in creating these kind of landmarks or monuments of like sites that are meant to be occupied but also observed and to like trigger our memories and our affection for a place um, and so I think in some ways the towers themselves it's like I think a little bit this like concern that we have that maybe some parts of them are a little heavy handed and they then uh, they go so far that they plug the thing that you want or they isolate, like by lifting it up and isolating it, it may not have the kind of connectivity and accessibility that you're interested in. So I would just, you know, I would suggest that as a, as a reference that and the step well and, and kind of looking through that. And then my question is, is what do you think this architecture thesis added to your undergraduate degree? Like how did you, how did this, this thesis project which seems to converge 
your, uh, you know, previous training and education, like what, what sort of, how did, what synthesized in this project for you that you really find significant? Uh, it really just reinforced the belief that I have that you can't just have object buildings. You can't just have these, these perfect sites because the world's messy. And it's a lot of embedded systems that need to be thought of, sort of like an organism. Um, and that thought to try to embrace the chaos, but embrace the network and, and sort of try to give it a framework that it could eventually continue. That is the, the thought process that I've really tried to embody here. And I like the continuing because it's getting us to think, like for me, I think of your... Um... I'm calling it the vascular system, but I don't know, you're calling it the boardwalk, right? Or the connective tissue. I think for me, I would love to see how, like what happened in Valencia, but maybe not quite to that extreme, but something more appropriate for this area, how it can also become an amenity, right? Because right now it seems still like there's all this private farming. It's like, in, it's still, there's kind of an industrial farming aspect, but how do these things not just become like the residual of like an industrial, like office park, mm -hmm. which it kind of is vibing, but how does it start to create like an amenity for, you know, all the different neighborhoods and for like when we're crossing the street on our way to work, is there, is there like, are there cafes or are, like, are you reconnecting again and creating program in places right now where there's this huge gash and this emptiness, right? And that creates this um, real like moat, right? And so, um, I, yeah, I think, I think you were able to do what you, your ambition was which is this idea that your work can set something, set the stage for future work and, you know, do the phasing and think of things like, like that. So thanks. Yeah. And I wanted to build on that. So, okay. One of the things I really appreciate th about this project is it's a big idea. And because it's a big idea that feels, I'm going to use the word fertile, it's very fertile, right? And I think we can all start plugging in and I'm starting to imagine I'm going to step up here is, you know, if your next diagram started to figure out how this, you know, wasn't just green here, but connected to the neighborhoods here. And so an example I think about is the Lafitte Greenway in New Orleans, which was a canal, then it was a train track, and now it's a greenway. And then there was all this community work in all the neighborhoods deciding we want a basketball court here, we want this here, we wanted that there. And so then it isn't just another gash, right? It's actually starting to connect to the park here or to the church there. And this is an area where you start feeding cafes against, you know, against this wall or, you know, new businesses um, or like in Detroit where there was um, an area where there was urban farming, there was an elementary school that had women with who were single mothers. There was a um, uh, daycare for them. And then they were also learning about caring for animals and farming. So there was other kinds of connections that I think everybody here could come up with. What about this and what about that? But in the drawing it only this way, we lose the sense that it feels like a cut again, um, as opposed to your image, right? Which is about how it literally feeds people, but also feeds the economy and feeds the education. And so even if you modified this so that we showed examples in some areas of how it could connect to some resource here and some park here and how there are bridges, literal bridges, and also programmatic bridges, it would be another layer to this project, which gives that potential that's so in it. I see Bill's wanting this. Well, you know, I don't really have feel like I have anything new to say because all these are such substantive uh, observations and comments. But I'll start out by saying, you know, you explaining your undergraduate background ex explains the not only the interest and your passion and almost a mission of what your thesis and where your career trajectory is going by virtue of this point as a, in time. You know, it's, it's almost like I was thinking that, you know, you've done such extensive programmatic research and connected at such a national and global scale and and to certainly problems within our our country but it's inherent throughout the world um in that sense it's almost like you know if this was um if this was a collaborative team you know you could go for both a research um grant you could go for a research competition like the pa research thing and also if you have a specific proposal 
And so my, my reaction to this is that, you know, you've done a master plan that's programmatically noble, um, extremely big ideas. The word heroic was used and the iconic towers even strikes me of things that I remember seeing some of the 1960s, 70s um, office complexes. Kevin Roach, monolithic, almost prismatic Egyptian kind of monuments laid out in, a, in the landscape. And I think that this is, a, this is wh where you start. But if you went back, maybe the next layer, and maybe to think about, so, what, you know, think about, to me, I would ask you, but it's too much time, maybe, you know, what was the interdisciplinary team that you recognized that you'd want to bring to bear? Because if you do extend into the grid, maybe the start is your analysis that had the cultural institutions, the economic hubs, the open spaces, and you would see how, how each of the, divisions of this, maybe it's not just the, the industrial production and then the core of the center area that, and then the towers might have a certain iconic affinity, but they actually are shifted off axis, mm -hmm. have nuanced and reflective in, again, trying to make the appropriate uh, smaller scale connections to groups of blocks mm -hmm. that have certain different characters that might also help catalyze the rejuvenation in ways that, that this, while it's noble, um, it, it doesn't respond to the context in the way that we saw in the last um, two, the uh, two theses, actually, you okay. know, in their own way, focusing on the notion of art as, as making connection and mixed use. And then, and then what was done in the gene, um, I think, I think, you know, you, you all learn from each other in these theses and it's a great cluster to have here today. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a very impressive project and um, very impressive research. And, you know, just having, I did a studio in this area and it is extremely difficult. Um, and one of the problems is that um, there's no land value. None, really. There's a lot of empty houses. You, you and I could go buy one for $25 and not that you'd want to live up there, but it's extremely, you know, talking about one of the world's tough problems, it's very difficult because... These days, people don't want to tear things down some more and rebuild, although you could argue that might be a case for doing some of that here. What I think what I think this does, though, and, and if you thought about this as if this was a real, a real project, what you would want to do, I think, is phase this in a way that did kind of a, a, a proof of concept for a block or two to see if you could get it to work and it could make money and it could it could stabilize itself. And I can imagine if you did that, maybe you do two or three blocks. I think the comments that have been made about connectivity on either side are spot on, but then you'd have to come up with a strategy for the rest of it. You know, and it might, it might mean that the rest of it might just simply be planted. You know, you just see what happens from there. <laughs> In which case there might be reasons to build more of it or maybe not, but it would at least you plant the seed with the, <laughs> with maybe that, those two blocks up there that really are state the thesis to me very, very clearly and very, very well, and then go on with a different landscape idea for the rest of it, because it's, it's a lot of infrastructure for, um, you know, in, in terms of what it actually produces, it's a lot of bricks and mortar where it actually comes out the other end. And, and I think maybe a lighter touch or what, what do they call these days about um, the new urbanists call, um, uh, you know, the sort of light touch urbanism, you know, where you paint stripes on the ground and put cafe tables out and try and make a play. Tactical urbanism, it'd be something like that along, along the same lines to be able to do that. But it's, it's the completeness of this is astonishing. And it is, it is a ridiculous problem. I mean, the depth of that, that cut is frightening. And then exacerbated and it of course has had a collateral effect on the neighborhoods on either side because more there's more vacant houses within two blocks of that because it has such a kind of negative um sort of role to play there and i think this is really an admirable stab at, at something bringing agriculture into the city in a way that where, where there is no value is a very very um ambitious but i think a smart thing to try to do thank you hi julie <laughs> Wow. Well, congratulations. We knew this day would come eventually. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's been said this project is 
almost absurdly ambitious. <laughs> um, it's been such a joy working with you this uh, the, for the well for the past year, and the conversations we've had about all kinds of things from the global scale to the local have been really fascinating and enlightening and enjoyable. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things about what it was like working with Liam. <laughs> um, as you can imagine, he's very methodical and intellectually rigorous in exploring these ideas. Um, the research, the metrics, I mean, he was looking at, he was talking to agriculture experts on how many, uh, you know, acres per person or how many people per acre and looking at different scales of vertical farming, horizontal farming in between um, the thoroughness of the project, just mapping food deserts, mapping distribution networks, um, and studying the tectonics of Baltimore icons, um, and then synthesizing that into a very compelling and wide-ranging thesis proposition, which is what we've just been talking about. So, um, you know, the, there is a theory here, this idea of food as commerce and challenging that and growth from decay and trying to, and, and this new paradigm of 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 clustering production distribution and consumption in a way that um, would act as a prototype really for any any neighborhood in Baltimore or anywhere in the U.S. or the world. Um, so the comprehensiveness and of it is is really laudable. Um, and just kind of to wrap up, I know I'm talking a lot, but there's a lot. I mean, it's a big project. Um, re you relentlessly challenged the process itself and your own engagement with it. Um, so a lot of the things that have been said or suggested today have been diagrammed. <laughs> I mean, the, the, as much as you see on the wall here, there's at least that much that didn't, that got edited out. And so, you know, it's not that you're right and they're wrong or anything like that. Um, but I will say one thing that fascinates me about this problem is that how much of it to reveal, how much of it, and there were parks, there were parks down there, there was water down there at one point, there were wetlands down there, there was a bioswell, like, I mean, lots of great ideas um, that, you know, would eventually be explored by the team of 100 people for three years. Um, but what is the right scale? What is the right density? These were all the things that you were looking at. Um, how will these places be used? How will they knit the community? How will, you know, that this was front and center all the time. Um, and so I just want to sort of commend you on the creativity and the, you know, the intellectual rigor, but also the flexibility and just the kind of, I don't know, stick to itiveness of, of just coming back again and coming up and back again for more um, to, you know, just really um, get at this thing to raise possibilities for systemic change, but to do it in this, present a very a compelling vision that's so, that seems realistic too, in some kind of way. So um, congratulations. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see where this heads, where this goes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wanna see it on like WJZ news and you know, like the Baltimore banner needs to do an article about this. And yeah, that's right, yep. So, okay, congrats. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna make one final 90 degree turn. Thank you, thank you so much. I don't know if this goes. Good job. Uh, there is talk. Uh, no, too late. Too late. Thank you. I, I had one about 30 minutes. Yeah. 
Okay, everybody, we're about ready to hear about College Park. So this is as close to home as we're going to get this afternoon. Um, a good place to uh, to arrive. And um, we're going to hear from uh, Dylan Spanier. Dylan? Thank you very much. And first and foremost, thank you guys for all being here this afternoon taking the time out of your day to be here. So we all thank you very much. Um, so as Tillman mentioned, Professor Tillman mentioned, uh, my name is Dylan Spanier and I will be presenting communal integration, living and learning at the University of Maryland. So currently the University of Maryland has challenges of meeting the need of affordable housing options, which creates a lot of um, displacement and financial hardships to its students. Um, in particular, straining upperclassmen and graduate students to find the ability um, to meet the needs of affordable housing, which um, within close proximity of the university. Um, currently, the university um, has seven residential communities owning roughly 9,000 beds um, with an additional uh, 16,000 located within 1.6 miles of campus. Um, but with a population of roughly 41,000 people and students, uh, this leaves roughly 75% of the student population um, not living on campus. And most of those housing options are um, upwards of $2,000 a month. Um, approximately 58% of the housing is over $2,000. Um, so this thesis aims to establish livable communities driven by common interests or residential learning communities. Um, and providing affordable housing options that enhances the quality of living and learning environments to expand upon the current livable, uh, the current living learning programs found throughout the university to encourage people to work together towards a common goal and foster a close knit community that engages the university fabric. And this is a mix of a lot of different inputs, um, gender, race, uh, discipline, um, and the environments that you work in um, foster a closer knit community and allow for networking and uh, learning opportunities outside of the classroom. This all originated from medieval monasteries, the idea that these were centers of research, education, and the creation of knowledge, um, and fostering a culture of nonstop um, discussion, um, which ultimately led to the formation of the Quadrangle, um, which was seen at the University of Oxford and Cambridge, and was later adapted into the Americas through the way of Yale and Harvard, um, which were given their grants to establish residential colleges and placing scholars in a position where they could directly care for their students um, and bringing them under the direction of an adult. Um, so when we look at Yale, uh, the quadrangle, much like medieval monasteries and their predecessors of the University of Oxford and Cambridge, um, and allowing students um, to have the access to seminar spaces, meeting areas, um, as well as dining and uh, libraries, uh, print shops, um, athletic facilities, hobby spaces, all being facilitated by their academic professors and deans um, that would live with them in that community. And the way that these have evolved over time is within living learning programs, which we have established at the University of Maryland. And currently 16 of the 39 residential halls um, have some sort of living learning program, many of which are honors colleges at the university. So how does the university address the problem of its housing? <clears throat> um, with the purple line integrating in, we see massive developments through public-private partnerships, uh, mostly through Terrapin development, um, to establish housing opportunities along Route 1. But unfortunately, the university has been deemed all out of on-campus housing since 2009. Um, so we see massive housing developments uh, being integrated into Route 1. Um, and this is all thanks to the purple line and how the purple line is starting to affect the University of Maryland, making it a transit-oriented campus in a way. Um, but this has its effects. Um, based on property data, um, rent is increasing drastically around 
Um, the Purple on, in particular, campus, um, average rent has gone up to $2,571 a month, and the average apartment is only 900 square feet. Um, and as mentioned before, um, the university itself is out of its housing options. Um, and as of 2018, um, there was an extra 350 students um, that could not have access to its housing. Um, and we started converting lounge areas in our residential halls to try to meet the needs of those spaces. So the university tried to provide a solution to that, um, tried to integrate graduate housing here um, in Guilford Woods behind Domain. But unfortunately, this got a lot of backlash. Um, it was linked um, to many different issues, including smart growth, the deforestation of Guilford Woods, campus sprawl, um, the tree canopy, so a, a reduction in our forestization, um, which ultimately led to a protest um, on McKeldin Mall that brought these issues to the forefront of the university and our higher um, administration. Um, and the solutions that came out of that, one of which was to develop lot one, which was deemed to be true smart growth um, with the purple line integration within the near future. It would help improve stormwater management because of the massive surface parking lot that we unfortunately see, um, but also provided immediate transit access to the purple line and into the DC metro area and allowed for um, walkability to businesses and amenities from lot one. Um, and President Pines himself um, is making it a priority to provide more housing options that are located within easy access of campus um, and to the public transportation, um, including the Purple Line. Um, recently, we have seen massive proposals linked to the Purple Line, um, many of which by campus itself, um, looking to integrate more of um, the Purple Line into campus and how to develop it. We've also seen um, outsiders such as Design Collective and the Purple Line themselves being proposed, uh, pr bringing proposals to campus and along the Purple Line corridor. So as Purple Line starts to come through, obviously most of us are very familiar with this, um, going directly through the heart of campus um, and really um, starting to define the campus as a transit-oriented um, development. And in the near future, uh, campus could begin to start to make pockets of higher density along that Purple Line corridor, but we haven't seen um, development within lot one itself being proposed. So beginning to transform parking lot one into more of a residential community, currently the campus um, in figure ground looks like this, where we have the massive void on the western side of campus um, where that parking lot is located. Um, there's currently over 15,000 parking spots um, that would be removed. Um, and just zooming in a little bit onto parking lot one directly uh, diagonal from where we are currently located um, and beginning to transform that in a spatial way, um, defining the edges, de defining the opportunities and really trying to link in a mixed use development with the purple line response, but also residential communities that start to engage the university fabric. Um, so in phasing existing conditions, um, as mentioned, there are uh, 1,582 parking spots that would be removed. Um, and what's unique about lot one is its axial relationship to McKeldin, uh, McKeldin Mall. So using that as an influence to start to create um, segmented regions within lot one, as well as the integration of the purple line. Um, and as we begin to extend um, McKeldin, we start to create um, communities within um, parking lot one or now known as West Campus Village. Um, and then the future development that could be linked to the Purple Line um, that would be coming into um, campus within um, the upcoming years. So after all the phasing, we begin to have a more defined Western campus um, and we see the axial relationship all the way from the armory up through McKeldin Mall uh, Tall's Quad, and then into the Western Campus Village, which then bleeds into Global Campus. 
So the West Campus Village um, has come a long way, um, just process-wise, a lot of um, studying of urban form, spatial relationships, and how buildings can define figural spaces within um, uh, the places that we um, interact with. Um, obviously, we do have McKeldin Mall, uh, Meyer Mall, as examples of figural spaces within campus and bringing that into the West Campus Village. Um, to starting to get into more of the design aspect, um, currently parking lot one is obviously a parking lot, but we have on the uh, northern side is where the purple line corridor will go through. And on the southern side, we have campus drive. So beginning to integrate those as the edges and creating the spaces within the middle that um, foster and um, have the, uh, the housing within parking lot one. Um, and at the master plan level, we begin to see the spaces that are being created, creating six academic communities, um, and then having the lower theater at the uh, western end and the upper lawn to the, the eastern end. <clears throat> um, and this begins to define those corridors. We see the purple line um, corridor going to the north, campus drive to the south, um, which uh, was developed to have more of a human perspective and a more street atmosphere, um, integration of bike lanes and plaza spaces um, along the street corridor. Um, and perspective from within the upper lawn, um, looking at the crossroads, which is the spot that connects across the southern portion and the northern portion of the site. Um, as well as the, the eastern gateway as you enter into the site coming from Talls. Um, these spaces are um, flexible. The lower theater is more of a larger communal gathering space. Um, they could have uh, lectures or there could be other events that happen and the upper lawn is more of a flexible open space similar to how McKeldin is. And the integration of academic environments across the, the, um, the site happens in a horizontal dimension. Um, and these spaces are allow for communication, diversity, uh, social networking, and collaboration. The idea that you continue to learn um, from others outside of the classroom in the places that you live. And this can be seen um, at a larger scale here. Um, moving down into um, half of the site, the lower portion, the southern portion of the site, um, focusing in on the uh, campus drive corridor, creating more of a central plaza space um, in relationship to domain, um, and also a western plaza filled with bioswales to help with stormwater reten retention from the site. Um, Within the communities, there is also uh, a, more of a corridor um, that connects these three um, communities together and focusing more on the internal growth and the focus collaboration within um, that corridor. Um, zooming into C6, which is the closest to our building, um, the uh, southeastern corner of the site um, where you have more true academic spaces, um, classrooms and seminars flanking the, the main lawn, as well as office and admin spaces, um, and then community lounges, um, as well as bike storage and event space that can be utilized by the university for various um, gatherings and exhibitions. <laughs> and that event space, oops, sorry. Uh, that event space goes up into the second floor um, as a double height space and starts to integrate more of a vertical community um, within the building as well. Um, and this vertical community are the, um, the collaborative environments. These environments can be flex, uh, flexible spaces and hold larger lecture series. Um, they can be lounges or they can be more of a library setting for uh, research as well. Um, and the activated corridor um, could be used as a linear gallery um, within the, the livable units as well. So each unit um, has its own kitchen, its own living room, 
Um, and there is six person suites as well as four person suites and a resident assistant, um, most likely um, a graduate level mentor that can facilitate and help with um, just overall campus um, or um, be more specific in uh, helping with academic issues. Um, so this is a view from one of the balconies looking down into the court, um, the communal courtyard. Um, and you can see how those volumes of spaces, those collaborative environments start to affect and puncture um, the, the main facade. And then walking into um, the community from Campus Drive. Um, and again, seeing um, those, those academic collaborative spaces being integrated into um, our housing. So lastly, just to reiterate, um, this thesis aims to create livable communities driven by common interests um, and establishing livable communities um, that foster a close-knit community that engages with the university fabric. So at this point, I would love to turn to you guys and get your feedback, and thank you very much. It would be a mix of graduate and undergraduate, correct. Uh, it wasn't a part of, to be a part of families. It's um, for how, oh, sorry. It's for um, academic residents. Uh, no. So this would be owned and operated by the university. Of okay, so it's like university housing that they. Correct. Okay. And this is just one example of a bunch of them? Correct. Uh, the building that I developed is, would be one example of, of the, whole, the thing. whole project. Okay, thanks. And since we're just, get, uh, how many will this house, this full? So the, the, the building that I developed has 209 beds. Um, and across the entire site, it would be roughly 1,500 uh, residents. Okay. Across all six communities. All six. So across all six um, communities, there would be roughly 1,500 residents. Within the the building itself that I developed, it would be 209. But is that 1,500 in one? Yes. I have continued to ask some aspects of programmatic questions in addition to understanding the context. You did a very thorough job about um, explaining that and talking about the factors. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with um, things about the university, about what's been challenges and all that before. So in the displacement of the parking, you know, what did you learn about um, losing that number of spaces when, um, you know, this is the primary footprint of, of game day, which is so important to the university, especially for right. football, which drives all the other sports. That's an yeah. economic and also a spatial challenge. Um, it was also very contentious under the purple line when the planning of the routes for the purple line mm. that were very highly publicized. That's one question. And and then secondly, um, related to, you know, landscape, both cultural, ecological, and, um, you know, functional reasons. So, you know, there's there, the university and its master plans has always presented itself as having less Recreate, outdoor recreation space than most of its peers, especially since we joined the Big Ten. So those are those are large issues that I think drive about how you look at sh proposing this community in this location and shaping it. Yep. So if you can elaborate that about yep. that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, so just going back a little bit, um, um, the idea of removing parking spaces is obviously an issue. Um, but I think the reliance on our purple line and really starting to reimagine how we commute to campus, how we come and go from campus, um, resolves at least one of those aspects. Um, there is um, at least left of a parking lot, um, which I was proposing a parking garage to help bring back the amount of parking that would be lost. Um, and to answer kind of the football and tailgating question, I think um, 
we still have spaces that can do that. McKeldin, um, Meyer Mall, potentially within the community itself um, to bring in the public into where we actually kind of have those academic spaces. Um, so I think it's starting to reimagine the way we do things and the way that we operate um, because the surface parking lot is obviously an issue um, in terms of environmental issues um, and the removal of that is obviously not ideal because of everything that happens within that parking lot, not just parking. Um, so I do recognize that issue, um, but I think we have the spaces within campus to allow and to accommodate um, the removal of the parking. So um, what's the incentive for the university to build all this? Because it would just be housing like students eight months a year, right? Correct. And I think a lot of like, because like we at Michigan, we um, we deal with beds all the time because beds imply there the cost of building new beds is directly tied to additional uh, tuition revenue is directly tied to teaching cost and administrative costs and anyway so it's like so what's that kind of incentive or is this more just like a hypothetical thing and then um I really appreciate the football question but it's like also like Michigan um <laughs> we're doing well this year thank you in spite of Harbaugh um but it's only like seven home games a year right and so I think the there's a there like we're always grappling with that issue right because the home games bring in a lot of revenue. It's not just like a kind of nostalgic att attachment. It, it, it's like a, it's a huge money-making event, um, but we don't really have a lot of parking. It ends up just being distributed around our neighborhoods, but we're also suburban campus. So um, I guess I was just curious, like what the, what the kind of background of that is, the parking argument, I thought, or the game and all of that stuff like what's your take on that what's your hot take on that so those are my kind of two questions one what's the incentive of the university to invest in all of this if it's only for eight months a year and then because um, we also deal with the housing we want housing to be 12 months and so there's a lot of pressure to redevelop redefine the school year along 12 months but that gets in a whole bunch of other problems so mm -hmm. just not saying you had to deal with it but i was just curious um I will try to answer that question. Um, the incentive for the university, I think, is to expand on um, not just how we live on campus or how we commute to campus, but integrating more of actual true academic environments into the building. Um, so as the campus continues to grow, um, the potential for these Interesting, I lost my PowerPoint. Um, the potential for these um, buildings to kind of become mixed use environments rather than just you go to class here and then you come back and live here. I'm not saying that when you are when you live in a community that that's the only place that you'll ever go on campus, um, but integrating more actual academic, true academic classrooms and seminar spaces within the built environment where we live. Um, to go to the football question, like you mentioned, we only have, you know, six or so home games a year. Um, so I think the the spaces that we have on campus, such as McKeldin, um, could start to become those spaces um, for those events, if that helps answer your question. Got a couple of questions about precedent. Uh, you, you showed Oxford College and Yale and Harvard. Um, the, the precedent for Yale is very much about creating the center of student life uh, in these residential colleges and you live there for at least three years. Um, and there's kind of a commitment that the vast majority of students can live in those so that they'll have an equal, equally accessible student life, right? You're creating a huge number of uh, living situations here and yet it's a tiny percentage of what's needed right i think yeah. i think you still need like 20,000 or something if right. i did the math right okay so so then i guess your precedent 
changed along the way in terms of what are you providing? I, I yep. guess you're pro providing more spaces on campus for students to live, but it can't become a solution that solves it for everyone. Can't, can't even come close. Um, there's other, there's a spatial precedent also involved in the Yale courtyard buildings. Um, they're never very tall. Uh, they, they have a figure that is largely enclosed. I, th I think actually every single one is enclosed on four sides. Um, and then there's a, there's a uh, dining hall building that's lower in height. And so you get some relief, but but that precedent changed quite a bit here. I think it'd be interesting to overlay, you know, what would be the size of a block if you were to enclose a courtyard space? Um, I suspect the block would get a little bit longer to accommodate the legs. I, I don't know, did you do that test at all? Uh, I did do um, diagrammatic um, tests and I wish I could go back in my PowerPoint um, of, <laughs> I just get the Zoom screen um, of, taking the footprints of Yale um, and adapting them into um, parking lot one to see the scale difference. Um, I also took South Campus Quad, um, which is probably the closest thing we have to a Yale model of the centralized courtyard. Um, and there was a difference of about 1,100 students um, that could actually be in that parking lot one. Um, so there was um, oh, you, you lost 1,100 students? So with the Yale model, it was like 2,200 students. With the UMD model of South Campus Quad, it went down to 1,100. Um, so there was a drastic scale difference of how um, just the building footprint um, influences uh, the amount of people that can yeah. live there. Okay. Uh, I mean, my, my point is that the nature of the outdoor experience or the nature of the feeling of being within a a unit uh, is very different when you have essentially linear buildings. So you, you've got the major public space and then essentially you have linear buildings with another almost as major public space rather than courtyard buildings. I th just wanted to point out that it gives you a different experience. It's not necessarily good or bad, but it's it's different. Um, so I want you to be intentional about that. Yeah. Um, another question about precedent. Um, I assume that there are all sorts of rules on this campus about the building materials. See a lot of brick buildings, a lot of red brick buildings. It's been yeah, changing. It's okay. Changing. Okay. And is that intentional that your architecture is decidedly different? Uh, yes. Yes and no. Um, I wanted to incorporate more of a mass timber um, building. Um, the, the base of the building, the ground floor is brick um, to help kind of link back into the context. Um, but to create innovative buildings that aren't the traditional style of the campus, um, but bringing in aspects of materiality that we find on campus. Um, I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah. And is, is this a mass timber building? It is. Yeah. It can be done for residential. It's a little more difficult, but it can be done. So I actually have a question for you. Um, you know, the residential college system at, at Yale and a couple of other universities um, is largely based on a community of scholars that, that do not necessarily share a, a common uh, academic focus or interest. And, you know, that that's also a distinguishing factor of that model. Would, would you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I was thinking about that when he was presenting. I'm not sure I know the historical reason for that decision, but uh, having experienced living in that, I know it gave me the freedom to think however I wanted to think about a, a, a direction for education, that uh, while there's a benefit probably to being gathered up with students of a like, like mind and like direction, there's also a detractor about that, which is the future flexibility. Do I have to leave my residential college if I focus on chemistry instead of architecture? You know, I don't know. I think that that may be what it is. And it essentially just became a purposefully mixed group of students in each one. Um, first of all, 
it's like so convincing like the last project you know you're like every image is beautifully crafted all of your your slideshow is also very convincing and you know it's like we can literally look out the door and I, I think probably many people would very much like like the idea of more housing on campus um so it's sort of like it's interesting to see a thesis project that's so uh in brick and mortar. This is how we're gonna. This is what we're gonna do. This is like every step along the way. You're kind of creating a, a positive and realistic and well informed step. So I'm gonna ask a question that about where in the design process of just specifically the not the overall mm -hmm. project, but just in the living situ living in the dorms or the housing. Was there a moment or is there something about this dorm that makes it stand out from others? Or do you really want it to be a dorm that is, you know, re replicated across campus? So, for example, do you think the, you know, you show the, the flex and event and the lounge. Are there any spaces that are really uniquely, that are unique to this building or is this? Yeah, so throughout the process, the original intent um, of the process was to have um, each different disciplines based on the residential system to live in the building. So, for example, uh, if we went back to previous, um, this could just be an architecture building and those spaces would be adapted um, and tailored to uh, architectural intent. Um, but through the process, it was kind of made clear that uh, the networking opportunity of living with a business major or um, a performance major um, had benefit not just in the networking but learning from others as you're living um, so i think those spaces at one point were going to be highly focusing on whatever discipline you are um, but throughout the process they became more about allowing people to network with other disciplines um, and learn from other disciplines, not just your own discipline. Um, I think there is still an opportunity to hyper-focus in a building and create the architecture building or business building. Um, but it seemed throughout the process that to integrate more of multidisciplinary um, majors within one building and having the, the double high collaborative environments be flexible and have the ability for us as students to learn from one another. Yeah, I'll ask, I'm just gonna ask a follow-up. So that's kind of a decision that you're making as a designer, but let's say, you know, you move on to another project, university decides to put whoever they want in there. Mm -hmm. What is it specifically about the architecture that would that demands that you have like multidisciplinary, multi -dis multiple disciplines in the building? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think, um, hmm, the, the, the massing of the collaborative environments, I think, is what really highlights um, the ability for us to have multidisciplinary um, interactions um, and having those uh architecturally be visible from the exterior um so i i hope that kind of helps answer the question um so what makes this building this specific dorm special and different from the others is it your idea that there are these sort of i'm using my terms not yours but like there are these the uh, the salmon color the orange boxes there are these cultural experiences or hubs that sort of pop up randomly um within this building and that's what's different about this dorm than all the other dorms um, um more or is, less is, yes is, is um, it like, i think it's the integr the true integration of on the ground floor of classrooms and uh, seminar spaces and then having the the vertical presence okay. within the building um so 
on the ground floor you're you, you have like education mm -hmm. and you have like like i don't know, general education classrooms correct is am i to understand that yes that can be utilized by the university right so you you can actually go downstairs to a class if you're lucky enough to be in this building or or across and down and then you have these two story moments that appear randomly like if they were building a second one of these c2 was the same then there's do you get three community or three cultural or three experiences per per, per floor or like how like is was there a logic that you came up with with the ratio of like social spaces to rooms uh yes and no um i'll be honest um yep. It was it was an attempt to have a variety of different scales of mm -hmm. collaborative environments, both on the interior and the exterior. Right. Um, all the way down to the unit of the dorm, um, where you have more of a suite style, mm -hmm. um, and then expanding into that into um, right. the vertical double high collaborative environments that spills out into the courtyard, which then spills out into the upper right. and lower lawn. Right. Well, all right. Well, what I will say is that. You know, every single diagram, every single um, thing on here is just carefully and well drawn. You took a problem, a real problem, a problem up the street, and 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 put all of your your education and your training. You really tried to solve this problem, and you tried to. Um, it looks to me that you tried to say, "I'm going to solve this, and I'm going to solve this," you know, with the tools. And with the understanding that we have today, basically all you have to do is, you know, press the play button and we could do this on that parking lot tomorrow. I guess we would need the red, the purple line to go in. Um, and so I, I can, I can applaud your approach and, you know, the, the, the thoroughness and the, the detail and the, the effort and, and wanting to present a solution that is uh, understandable and relatable and feasible and executable. Um, I applaud that approach here. Thank you. I was just going to add that, um, first of all, whether this is contentious or not, I don't know, but um, I I don't think we have to make buildings. I think when I ask, is it, is there, what's so special about it? I'm not, I don't think that we have to make buildings. Every single building doesn't have to be like a vanity project or some crazy, no, no, no. Okay, good. Well, I just want to be clear because I think it's a really, um, it's a beautiful project. And like you said, I think you can go step. And I, I feel like I, you've done so much. So my next comment, you should just almost ignore. But if, if there was like one more week, I would love to see. Trust me, I wish there was one more week. <laughs> if there was one more week. Trust me, I do. I my my ask would be to see the structure and to see this because when you said it's mass timber I was like oh like yeah I had no idea that's going to be so beautiful I mean your images and the renderings are really 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 beautiful the atmospheric image you showed for like one second at somewhere right. in there I was like so beautiful so um yeah I'll come back next week and see it if you if you do it <laughs> um I guess my question I have a question and I have like a comment and so um actually no I have two questions okay first first question is what is the like alter ego of this project or your alter ego like the kind of counterfactual like this is me just like blowing it up kind of project version like what's what's the hypothesis there like this is the this is the my comment is this is the you're hired project. Like yeah, anyone yeah. who sees this is going to be like, you're hired like tomorrow. But what is the kind of like intellectual fantastical version of this project for you? And I don't mean the design or the outcome, but like, what, what is that question that you're asking, right? Like is the question about housing? Is the question about campus? Is the question about affordability? Is the question about mass timber? Like what's that like counterfactual fantastical project alter ego to this? Yeah. And you can just bullet points. It doesn't have to be this thorough thing. Like, what are those? What are those thoughts that came into your head and, and stuff? And then, um, and then uh, the other question would be: uh, I'll ask that after you answer this. So you okay. can just focus on one thing at a time. Um, so, to answer that question, I think um, it really became a question of how do you actually learn 
um, what is the best ways to learn um, and who do you really learn mm. from. Um, you learn so much in these actual settings, but you also learn so much from your peers. And I think that is at the core what the project wanted to highlight is that we can incorporate multidisciplinary um, people in one place and having moments within the actual housing to still have those opportunities to learn from each other outside of the classroom. And so what do you think is architecture's role in facilitating that or orchestrating that? Like what, what to you is that, that power of architecture? How would you describe it? Um, that is a great question. I think- um, It'd just be your opinion. Yeah, I, I think the, the scale of, the different scales of um, collaboration, I think was what I was highlighting in terms of the architecture, mm. um, that you can share a, a room with somebody else and learn from them. And then within that unit, you have five other people that you can learn from. And within the building, you have hundreds of other people that you can meet. Yeah, these different scales of sites the and different, different scales of and different programs and stuff. Correct. And then in reverse, I feel like you're saying the, you, in reverse, you're sort of saying the university is responsible to offer this to students, and this is a right. deficit on the campus right now. Yeah. And right. I think that's really amazing. It's yeah. like you're it's giving nice. meaning. Yeah, you're giving meaning to. I I, I think it's a great project. Okay, I had two. Okay, well, uh, why did you why did you pick this topic? You don't have. You can answer this quickly. A couple bullet points. Um, I think it's. You kind of kind of half answered it. So. <laughs> it it's kind of personal um, to me. Um, coming from a small school in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, with, I think, totaling 6,000 people, um, I think it was kind of a culture shock in terms of the housing prices that are down here um, and trying to find actual places to live in close proximity to campus um, and also just reflecting on how I've progressed throughout the years and who I've truly learned from, many of which are sitting in the back of the room. Liam, six and a half years together. So um, I, it was kind of a personal um, project that I realized when I came down here, just the extent of the campus and how difficult it truly was to find housing options around the campus. Those were great questions because they were analogous to one of the things that I was gonna ask is why did you choose this project and why did you choose a something on the campus. And um, I think the answers that you just gave are the fundamental things that won't just win you a project that is being presented here that's very believable. But it could, it could alter the university's thinking about how they look at continuing to evolve their thinking about their housing strategic plans, what the university means in terms of its place here as a central place in this region, and how they project that they're a world uh, that they're striving to be a world leader even beyond their aspirational peers in terms of how they're integrating, multi as you stated, multidisciplinary education and, um, and sort of the, the creation of a community both within the campus and how they're, how they're, how they're creating citizens to live in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most fundamental aspect. So this is very believable. You know, I, I could talk to you a long time. I've been involved with with this site for, for almost 20 years mm -hmm. and had many, many challenges in seeing how the university has grown. And I'll be glad to talk with you about that because it's this is another threshold for you to go move on with your career. And theses often um, as, a, as a benchmark of where projections where you might want to you know, yeah. make your career. Yeah. So anyway, congratulations. Thank you very much. I don't have a time. <laughs> So we, uh, we need to hear from the chair. Um, and here he is. Uh, Dylan, thank you for taking us on this journey with you. Um, I've known Dylan over the last couple of years. We had um, a great experience in 601 studio. And um, I thought the discussion of your thesis proposal was um, brought up some good points. The The first question 
about parking, Tanya and I were discussing Oslo and how there's no cars in Oslo anymore. And I know Ralph Bennett and I were waiting for you to say, everyone's going to take the purple line on game day. Uh, yes. Or, you know, there'll be some compact um, vertical structured parking sprinkled around campus. But the also all semester, actually last last semester and this semester, you know, I drive in from uh, university there. And so I, I drove past this thesis site every day on, on the way to those thesis meetings, just thinking about the kind of sea of asphalt and the runoff, um, the, you know, the, the contribution to the flooding at, at the Guilford Woods pond or stream. There's, I think the thesis um, uh, uh, addresses a lot of the environmental concerns that we didn't discuss, but I was happy to hear the discussion about kind of the, the needs of the university and the student's experience and, and how a, uh, an architecture student can address that experience with a, with a thesis proposal. So thank you very much. I also want to um, thank the other um, panels, panelists, uh, committee members, Juan Burke and Mohammed Garapur. We had a great time working with Jamie on the project. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Uh, so with that, we're um, at a conclusion of the afternoon. Um, I think we just uh, very briefly invite the uh, the jury uh, to make any general observations such as uh, they would care to make um, briefly, and uh, then we'll uh, <laughs> then we'll conclude the afternoon. And faculty, of course, we're we're going to um, head upstairs after this. So any. Final remarks. Thank you, everybody. I, I think the work was amazing. Um, and the level of quality for virtually every single student w was surprising to me. And so you're all to be commended. Really, really excellent work. And also, you, you, you portrayed a kind of optimism that is not in vogue right now. It's not, it's not in vogue to be optimistic about the future of the world, but you've kind of taken on this voice, you know, you've kind of taken on this voice that says we as architects um, have a voice, have a thought about the way to move forward. And we do want to elect most of you as mayor or provost or whatever is appropriate afterwards too, because you took on problems that are so big that they have a policy implication. And um, that was really interesting. And I think you heard a number of times how believable the solutions were. And so if you if you get over that credibility hump, then you've really got a chance of having a voice that can that can make change. So congratulations to all of you. Oh, I agree. I mean, uh, the the quality of the work, the the extent of analysis and research. And then the integration of the of all of the proposals was just really uh, really feeling making me feel optimistic and um, and I'm really proud of of what I've seen today. You know, it's a small sampling for me uh, in the school that's my alma mater, and um, you know the, the quality of the graphics, the but most importantly the quality of the thinking behind it all has been most impressive. And so just I'm going to commend everybody and. Of course, you have great faculty to work with and good mentors, and and I hope that you know it's interesting. Again, um, you know the projects that were were here today have a certain affinity where you know you look at you look at your your peers and your colleagues that are going to be fellow alumnus, and um, I think it's something we can take away from learning from each other, and hopefully that'll carry on to the future as alumnus and wherever you go, whether it remains locally or far flung in your careers. So congratulations again. Yeah, I echo that. The work was amazing. Uh, you should all be super proud of yourselves. These are real master's theses, theses in architecture. They show um, really thoughtful ideas and really amazing architecture. I'm impressed. And uh, what a great way, what a great bridge out to practice. I think this is a really amazing kind of presentation and um, engagement with the faculty and all your advisors. So good job, everybody. <laughs> 
Oh my God, you're so done. Are you guys excited? How excited are you? I remember how excited I was. Um, I wanted to say, I really appreciated being able to see what you each individually bring to the thesis, like the kind of things that are occupying your minds, the things that you're obsessed with, the things that you really want to tackle with this education that you're getting. I'm also like, I'm a guest here, I'm visit or a visitor, and it's so great to see the evolution of architectural education, which to me kind of, I'm reading from my notes because I, I just really wanna be precise about how I see like all of this is evidence that education is shifting because what you're bringing to it, what your priorities are for are in architecture, your interest in the built environment and in the kind of agency of that is also shifting. And it's very different than when we were in school or when we did our theses, and yet there are continuities and, and that's like such a beautiful thing to do. And I would just say personally, um, I'm very, very, very interested in understanding how architecture itself participates in social change. So seeing these like large scale ideas and the kind of range and spectrum of different communities, constituencies, um, problems, opportunities, and things that you all are tackling just in this little sample set um, was just so exhilarating. So thank you so much for uh, sharing. Your personality or passions have shown in, the, in your projects. This has been um, really great fun and a, and a privilege to see your progress. I will just say that uh, all of this hard work that you have done uh, when you cross over into the real world, uh, the, the rigor that is necessary in research doesn't stop. There's a reason why you did all of this. Um, you know, great research leads to, you know, great solutions. So that happens on the other side. Um, the, the point in one of the projects, um, I think still is behind, you know, collaboration becomes, it's not a, a cute word. It's, it's how, you, how business happens. Negotiation is how business happens. You've learned all of that and you've, you've experienced all of that in this process to get you to today. So congratulations. And I will see you on the other side. <laughs> Um, and just we want to thank all of you for joining us today it's been an amazing afternoon so thank you again on behalf of the school All faculty head upstairs to the Dean's Conference Room. Thank you.